everybody are you as excited as i am to get to the end of this episode because holy shit i'm gonna have such a good time tonight there is so much good stuff to get to oh it's uh we're 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 really getting to it hey s john paul with the 20 dollars right off the bat i've been binging these streams so that i can watch live at some point I'm currently in part nine thank you so much for introducing me to umi neko you are so talented also the voice acting is mwah you truly exist. <laughs> Marcy exists. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate it. Glad that you've been enjoying it. Also, yes, uh, Daniel. Well, uh, technically it's the 12th here, but yeah, that's why I didn't s schedule anything for tomorrow. I'm like, it's April 13th. It's Homestuck Day. I'm sure that some shit is going to happen. I have to be prepared for it. <laughs> um, oh God. Um, so... Before we get started, I also wanted to let you guys know <clears throat> that I, I, I actually, um, in a manner of speaking, uh, putting it this way is, 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 may make it sound a little bit more extreme than it actually is, so don't get, like, too, like, d d don't get your expectations too high or anything. But uh, for this stream in particular, uh, I have modded the game. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, what I mean by this is that in episode three, there is a very particular uh, track in the soundtrack that uh, very recently got a new version of it uh, that was used specifically for the stage play version of episode three. And I kind of prefer that version of the song, not gonna lie. So I figured out how to go into the game's files and uh, replace the original track with the stage play version of the track. So, when it plays, I will be able to let you know that that is the stage play version of the song. Uh, that, that's it. Nothing, nothing super fancy, but uh, I think it was uh, pretty cool. 
Uh, and, it, and it worked exactly as I wanted it to when I checked on it, so. <clears throat> anyway, uh, tonight we finish episode three. And boy, boy, oh boy, is there a lot to get to. So why don't we not waste any more time? Why don't we get right to the meat? But first we have to we have to start with George. Too bad. <clears throat> Beato and George could be seen in the parlor of the mansion. George was kneeling near Shannon's body as though praying. Her face his face well <laughs> his face was sincerity itself, and there was even sweat on his forehead. However, Beato was the same. Now that she had handed her name over, most of her previous power had been lost. Of course, she was still more than a, she still had more than enough power to be called a witch, but compared to the past, it was a very faint thing. Good. Don't talk to her. Don't touch her with your hand. Call to her with the voice of your heart. Seek her with the hand of your heart. Only your strong feelings can make my magic reach Shannon's lost soul. George maintained a single-minded focus. He kept frantically yelling inside his heart trying to call back the soul of the person he loved. He strongly envisioned his soul leaving his body and searching for her as she wandered through hell. Beato turned that strong force into magical power, supplementing her own magic. It was magic that in the past she could have performed easily without anyone's help. But now, if she didn't rely on someone's help, she wouldn't be able to finish the chant, much less succeed. I've forgotten after several hundred years was magic, was resurrection, always this difficult of a magic. An even more strained expression than George's had risen to Beato's face. She was still forgetting this, but the magic to revive a life is fundamentally the hidden art. It was her previous magical power, giving her the ability to use that magic over and over with a snap of her fingers, that was abnormal. Therefore, the heavy burden to her body and mind was by rights absolutely to be expected. However, the power this one has is quite considerable, even though he doesn't know magic. I see. So he truly is Kinzo's grandchild. The strong power pouring from George was even large enough to pass as magical power. At first, Beato thought it was due to the blood of the mage, Kinzo. However, that was probably wrong. She had a feeling that Battler had taught her that. George's power to feel sorrow for the death of his loved one arose from the way he had tried his hardest throughout his life. From the warm time spent together with Shannon, and from the size of their shared dream, promising each other their futures. Do humans really live this seriously during their one single life? Of course they do. To her, a life didn't mean anything more than the difference between the top and bottom of an Othello piece. If the black represented death, then she thought all you had to do was flip it over again and make it white. However, it was just like that broken vase. To humans in a world without magic, where they can never return to its original form, it is very, very natural for them to bet all their body and soul on that single life. Oh, it skipped a little bit? <coughs> uh, YouTube, don't do that. So, there are times when an endless witch with full command over even life and death is inferior to a finite human for whom even Death's Mountain is impossible to cross. Now the witch acknowledged it. He was able to hold a magical power that could not reside in witches who didn't understand the value of life. What is this thing called the Endless Magic for again? Even though I call myself the Endless Witch, have I been forgetting what the Endless Magic means for a whole thousand years? She looked at George's expression again. His surging earnestness was like a lightning bolt. Right now, even if George's body was burned or smashed by a waterfall, he would probably continue to pray for his beloved without minding it, without noticing it. For the first time, she showed respect for that power. So in that instant, all magical resistance was lost, and the enormous power of George's feelings turned into magical power in its perfect form. The vase was very, very beautiful rich with history and value. Even as young as I was, it still forced me to take a deep breath when I witnessed its beauty. 
but that just made me want to touch it. But the vase fell easily and sm smashed into smithereens. Like a popped bubble, it felt as though the time when it had possessed a form was just an illusion. It was that fragile, that easily lost, that life. I realized that because of my own foolish curiosity, I had done something that couldn't be taken back. No matter how much I regretted it, no matter how much I apologized, the broken vase would not return to its original form. A lost life will not return to normal, no matter what happens. I was frightened by the fact that my own frivolous action, even though it had been frivolous, had stolen a life that could never be revived again. And out of pity for the lost life, I cried. Out of fear of myself, who had made it become lost, I cried even more. I was sure that Grandfather would also cry at the loss of his precious face. I was sure that all of the people who thought fondly of Grandfather would cry too when they saw him like that. By just the loss of a single life, the whole world would be filled with so much sadness. I cried even more at how terrible that would be. Uh, Andy Cosmos with the $10. So happy to catch one of these lives. Thanks for getting me into Umineko with these streams and making me annoy all of my friends by talking about it constantly. I hope you're having a good day. I relate to you so heavily right now. That's the thing about Umineko. Once you get into it, it never leaves. <laughs> it, it never stops being a consistently, like, huge brain worm forever. Uh, get, get used to being here. You will remain here for the rest of your life. <clears throat> Beatrice appeared and spoke. Then, milady, let us revive this vase with magic. If that will make everyone happy, then the vase and the magic and the spirits should be happy to lend you their power and return to its original form. Come, milady, close your eyes and say the chant with me. Come, try closing your eyes and try to remember... What form did you have? It was surely a very, very beautiful form. Please, show me that form one, one more time. Those words of power powerfully knocked on the door to Hades. Her previous magic had powerfully knocked on the door to Hades in the same way. However, back then, it was horribly violent, and earned the displeasure of the peacefully sleeping dead. However, this time was different. It was very powerful, but it was very kind and loving. The de dead near the door opened their eyes, and called out to the other dead that was there, that there was a voice calling for someone to come back. The sadness of that voice calling from the outside touched the hearts of the dead, and trying to respond as quickly as possible, they searched for Shannon's lost soul. Citrine Rain with the Canadian $10. Just finished episode 6 of the manga, so I won't be able to participate in theory time, but I can't wait to see the VN version of all the scenes. Ooh, interesting. Yeah, the, the manga of some of that stuff is uh, has a, some very interesting nuances to it. Um, yeah. Keep an, keep an eye out for the stuff that you know, because uh, retrospective reading in Umineko is definitely very, very cool. <clears throat> and then, they found it. They found the casket in which Shannon was peacefully sleeping. It truly was Shannon's soul, sleeping in the land of the dead. Inside a casket that was covered with rose petals, frozen with frost, she was sleeping in peace. The dead silently lifted that casket up. While it looked like a funeral march at a glance, it had the complete opposite meaning. It was solemn, but filled with joy. It reminded the long-forgotten dead that they continued to be loved even after their deaths, and gave them all a warm sense of peace. Then, as though guided by a warm light from the heavens, Shannon's body floated up out of the casket. The dead watched her go. They squinted at that warm light, giving their respect to this unknown member of the living who had continued to hold on to his love for a person even after her death. Shannon's body was sucked into the light in, in the heavens and began to disappear. In the jet-black darkness of the land of the dead, 
the faint flickering of gold butterflies could be seen. It reminded them of the gentle stars in the night sky, which they had long forgotten. <laughs> George remembered being told that he must not say anything, and he hurriedly covered his mouth. However, it felt like his heart was trying to jump out of his throat, because he hadn't seen Shannon's eyelids shake slightly. He had seen Shannon's eyelids shake slightly. And then, those eyelids slowly opened. Shannon's eyes were there, but they were still covered in the frost of the land of the dead. However, the warmth of the human world, no, the warmth of her loved one, who had called her soul back, dissolved, slowly dissolved that frost, and her eyes gradually regained their sparkle. Then, her eyes moved and recognized George. George, son. As her lips shook weakly, Shannon definitely said that. The words were very faint, so much so that they normally wouldn't even have reached his ears. However, George clearly heard them. He heard his loved one, his fiance, the one he loved most who should have been dead, call his name once again. Shannon. Shannon, can you recognize me? George, son, is this a dream? No, this isn't a dream. See, look, even if I pinch you, you don't wake up. As George said that, he softly pinched Shannon's cheek. It was how George had always responded in the past when Shannon had been surprised by something and had asked if she was dreaming, when Shannon felt the warm touch of George's finger on her cheek, and when George realized that the warmth of a living person had already returned to the cheek of his beloved, they both cried. Uh, check the character screen. Is she still alive? Is she alive there? Uh, let me check it. I'm curious. Uh, no, they have not changed her profile. <clears throat> With what words should a pair of lovers separated by death celebrate their reunion? The words of the human world are not enough to celebrate that. In short, they had no need of the words of this world. Shannon sat up and the two of them simply wordlessly hugged each other. Shannon still didn't have much strength in her and putting her arms around George's back took all she had. So George hugged her tightly to make up for that, to stop her from ever again going to a place beyond his reach. He hugged her so tightly and yet so gently. Shannon's fingers curled around George's back and on her ring finger, indeed, shone the engagement ring George had given her. That strong sparkle was absolutely not the sparkle of a diamond alone. There was without a doubt a magical power there that only the two lovers could possibly feel. It was because that strong light existed that they had been able to find her casket in the land of the dead. Beato understood that ring no. The couple's feelings, in the form of that ring, had created this miracle. Uh, Heartwolf with the $5. Sadly, I can't stay because of work, but I look forward to watching the VOD later. This has been such a treat. Good luck with work! <clears throat> in that moment, George had definitely used magic. Beato had done nothing more than help him along. That magic had a magical power that could only reside in those who knew of the importance of life and trying their hardest. It was the power of a miracle that an endless witch could not know, that only the power of the finite could give rise to. By now, she had no choice but to accept it. She had to accept that true magic, true magical power, existed in the place farthest away from she who called herself a great witch. Beatrice, Summer. She brought you back to life. Thank you, Beatrice. No. I could not do anything. What revived Shannon was your magical power. Your magic. I have indeed witnessed here the Oshiramiya blood capable of achieving miracles. George San was the one who brought... Mm. He had a phenomenal magical power, so much so that I could not reach up to his feet. So I still have not left the level of apprentice then. Now I finally know my place. <laughs> Beato staggered backwards. Her physical strength was clearly exhausted. She had humbly said that George's power alone had revived Shannon, 
but Beato had also used all of her magical and physical strength, and she reflected upon how difficult it was to revive a single one of these lives, which she had toyed with however she wanted in the past. The couple kept each other in their tight embrace and showed no signs of letting go. Feelings that couldn't be communicated with a billion words were thus communicated between them. Thank you, Beatrice. We are in your debt. Thank you very much, Beatrice Summer. I will never forget that it was you who let me meet with George again. Enough, enough. Being thanked by a pair of lovers is far too embarrassing for one who has been feared as an extreme savage. Don't worry about me. Take all the time you want celebrating your reunion together. Beato, who was leaning her back against the wall, slid down the wall and sat. How many centuries had it been since she, was la she had last grown this tired from using magic? Probably not since the first time I first succeeded in magic. Didn't Master praise me for that back then? Oh, but I myself killed that Master who praises me, didn't I? Don't be naive, Beatrice. In the end, that's what it means to kill something, right? Why? Finally, it seems you've remembered how to use magic. My whole head feels parched and suffocated, and I can't even think, let alone remember. Wait, didn't I kill you? You shouldn't be appearing. You've let me live until now. That's why I can appear like this. However, I did not come here to pat you on the head. Did you come here just to sneer at how pathetic I am? And after all this time, after retiring as a witch and everything, if I sit here and have my head patted, I'll be the laughingstock of the other witches. That's right. Not only are you a full adult, but you boast about having retired from active service. So I'm sure that it would be far too embarrassing to tell anyone that you only just now learned how to use magic. <laughs> yeah. Keep it a secret, Master. With a sense of pleasant despondency, Beato gazed at the couple, hugging each other. Love. Huh. I'm no match. 45. Data received. Firing preparations complete. Ammo selected. Now loading. Oh, no! Fortan firing! <laughs> The golden serpentine arrow fired by the Chiesters weaved its way through the bushes in the rose garden, weaved its way through the hedges, and climbed the stone steps toward the mansion's entrance, aiming for the keyhole. It weaved through the corridors and flew into the keyhole in the door to the parlor. <laughs> it happened in an instant. It would have been difficult for Beato, who was completely worn out, to have noticed it beforehand. Right before Beato's eyes, the gold snake that flew in through that keyhole spun circles around the two lovers and pierced through their two hearts in a blink of an eye. And with a meticulous precision, that gold snake ran through that hole in Shannon's chest once more. The two had been pierced through the heart by the gold snake. No by the gold sewing thread used by the new Brutal Witch's furniture, and it had only taken an instant, so unfitting for the amount of effort it had taken to revive Shannon. In front of Beato's shocked eyes, the two collapsed onto the floor. George! Shannon! Thank you, Beatrice for letting us meet, even just for a short while. Thank you. George spent his last breath thanking Beato and died side by side with the one he loved. The gold snake, which still sewed the two in place, spun like a large cyclone revolving around the inside of the parlor. It was searching for further kills in that room. Then the tip of the snake met Beato's gaze. In that instant, Beato prepared herself for death. Just then, Virgilia stood in front of her, the fingers of both of her hands drawing a mark. In that instant, gold-colored gold, gold leaf buried the inside of the parlor, 
It was like a blizzard of gold. Berto, escape while you can. No one can escape from the Chester's golden bow. 410, target lost. <laughs> yeah. Magical chaff. 45, understood. Modifying enemy search. Personal image homing algorithm. Target reacquired. Data link to 410. 410, data received. Too slow, nya. Predecessor sama. Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Impact! The Chester sisters' golden bow would not let its kill escape. It would not let them block it. No, ma no magical barrier could even dream of blocking it without being multi-layered. The weak point during the instant of confusion caused by Virgilia's deception magic was Beato's only chance to escape, and the only opportunity to make the sisters confuse Virgilia for Beato. As Virgilia spread her arms wide, blocking the way to her beloved disciple, the gold snake pierced straight through the location of her heart. The snake, which had snuck in through the keyhole, shot through George and Shannon, and then shot through Vigilia in an instant, completely failing to no completely failed to notice as Beato escaped. As soon as Virgilia saw that Beato had gotten away, she expired. The strength left her body, and like gold dust drifting with the wind, her form was erased. Beato completely erased all traces of her magical power, became gold butterflies, and passed through the wall, escaping to the wind and rain outside. Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! You bitch! You bitch! Beato felt sick from the bottom of her heart. Why? Because she had been attacked by the new witch? Probably not. Of course, she also felt sick over the loss of her master. But even more than that, Beato was enraged at the barbarism which had boorishly stolen the union between the two reunited lovers. Beato had poured out almost all of her magical power to reunite them. That miracle had been achieved only as a result of all of that, yet it had taken such a short time to steal it away. Beato trembled at the barbarous cruelty which had ended it so fast, and it was the true form of the acts she herself had committed up until that point. So just as strongly as Beato hated the new witch, she looked at her previous self with disgust. But now she had to escape. If she was targeted next, she would probably lose her life. And it wouldn't even be funny if the chess player descended descended like a god, ended up being attacked and killed by the pieces. Forty-five. Impact confirmed. Target scattered. Without a doubt, we crushed the predecessor. Our pile of kill medals is gonna get bigger again, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> what was that about loving couples? You get to enjoy them thrice, once tearing the two apart, once reuniting them, and once tearing them apart again, right? <laughs> and I feel great about getting to say goodbye to that fussy as fuck old hag at the same time. Ronave, you don't have any complaints, right? Why, of course not. Beatrice Sama. She interfered with the ritual of the witch's epitaph, you see. She revived a sacrifice from the first twilight without permission, and interfered with my ritual. No one has any right to, at all to complain. <laughs> Sucks that she doesn't leave a corpse behind, though. I was thinking of torturing that old hag to death over and over endlessly. <laughs> George did! He didn't show up! When did he come down? Uh, when? Uh, what time was that again? I think it was probably about four or five. It was at least an hour ago. We got sleepy and probably dozed off after that. But I think Jessica probably has it right. About one or two hours ago. I... I also remember it being around that time. Because I was asked whether I wanted more coffee. Something hard to believe had happened. 
Apparently, when Auntie Eva had left for a second to visit the laboratory, C Uncle Kraus and Aunt Natsuki had disappeared. There's no way they went hiding somewhere. Of course, the doors and windows had all been rigorously checked and all were locked from the inside. Not one of them was broken. And that wasn't just the first floor. The second floor was the same. Also, all of the window doors and windows were designed in such a way that they couldn't be locked from the outside. In other words, there was no way that Uncle Kraus and Aunt Natsui had gone outside. And yet, they couldn't be found. Furthermore, they weren't the ones who had disappeared. Astonishingly, George Aniki had too. George Aniki had left, saying that he was going to get more coffee, and had gone downstairs more than an hour earlier. I'd been under the impression that he was having a good conversation with Auntie Eva and the rest, but Auntie Eva, who had been in the lobby the whole time, said that no one had come down. Since all of the doors and windows are locked from the inside, it's hard to imagine that they went outside. Nevertheless, three humans had evaporated from this barricaded guest house, which had become a perfect locked room. It's hard to imagine any reason why they'd hide themselves away for a surprise prank in a situation like this. It's probably appropriate to think they'd become caught up in the crime. When Auntie Eva learned that her only son was missing, she went half insane, running from room to room and yelling his name loudly, and Jessica, who had suddenly lost both of her parents, followed suit. Cries of George, George, and Mom, Dad were even now continuing to echo through the guest house. I think George said something about wanting to see Shannon's face. It would be reasonable to imagine that he had snuck out of the guest house and gone to the mansion. However, I don't know about Uncle Kraus and Aunt Natsuhi. Maybe they guessed that that's what happened and went to the mansion to search for him? Without even telling Auntie Eva? At this rate, it's only a matter of time before we start talking about leaving the guest house to search for them. At this point, I'd be in favor of that. We said that shutting ourselves up inside the guest house would be safe and shut ourselves in this morning as a big happy family of 12 people. And ne yet, now there are only four people here. In other words, being here does not imply safety. However, there's something even more important that we mustn't forget. That's the fact that all of the doors and windows were locked from the inside. This is a locked room. How had they vanished from this place? Uh, Historian Sayori, I need a better system to remind me of when the streams are going. Uh, there is a little bell notification thing on the, uh, the upcoming stream page that you can tap and it will, like, send you a little YouTube notification, I think. <clears throat> We'd searched around thoroughly. However, we were unable to find any signs of anyone hiding. The two, three of them had almost certainly been taken outside the guest house. I wonder how they did it. You don't think... There might be something like a hidden door? A hidden door? The doors and the windows are impossible to lock from the outside by construction. Even using a fishing light of some kind, it would probably be impossible with the way they're, that, that they're constructed. In that case, it's probably reasonable to think that they left through somewhere other than a door or a window. You're right. That does make logical sense. No one can be sure that no hidden doors exist. However, before leaping to that conclusion, I suspect a much simpler possibility. And what would that be? For some time, Battler had been opening windows, opening the shutters, and checking outside, and repeating this for each window. Hmm. This window sure is quiet. I see. Unlike the other windows, this, the building's construction means that the wind doesn't blow into this one. It appears that way. It feels strange that no wind or rain comes in, even though there's so much of it outside. Dr. Nanjo, when I opened the window just now, did you hear a sound? Hmm? No, I did not notice it. I believe it's well oiled. In other words, it would be possible to slink out through this hall window with which, which no one was watching. Furthermore, the wind doesn't blow in through this window, so the air pressure wouldn't cause the curtains or a door to make a sound. It'd be quiet. Battler leaned out and looked at the ground below. He was searching for some sign that George had jumped down, but at a glance, he didn't see any mark like that on the grass in the middle of the pouring rain. There might also be a window like this on the first floor. It's possible to go outside without anyone noticing. However, not only the doors, but the windows too were all locked, and the shutters were even down as well, correct? It's possible to go out, but it would be impossible to lock up. But they can be locked, see? Just like this. Click. Battler closed the window and locked it, as though this was perfectly obvious. But, battler saw. you aren't saying. If someone inside locked it in the end, this locked room is as easy as pie. But, 
what that means. That means. Ooh. Nanjo turned pale and shook his head several times, because the thing that Battler said was presenting a certain truth to him that was frightening even to imagine. That's if they use the trick I thought of, of course. However, with this trick, only a very limited number of people can be suspected. He didn't want to say it in front of Nanjo, but after eliminating Jessica, who had been with him the whole time, the only ones who could have done it were Nanjo and Deva. Uh, I would not do anything of the sort. Uh, yes, I can swear it. In that case, it would become a battle between Auntie Ava and you for an alibi. We'd just, we'd just have to suspect the both of you and confine the two of you separately. To say it the other way around, this might be an effective trick if there were more survivors. But since our numbers have shrunk so much, it isn't particularly effective at all. No, in fact, there's a chance they could dig their own grave with it. It should have been more expedient to make it look like the culprit was outside, and to intentionally leave a door unlocked or to break a window. If this disappearing act has t had taken place midday today, I'd have probably announced this theory with full confidence. But at this stage, I'm not confident at all. What's going on here? What the hell does it mean? This locked room. You don't think, um... Hmm? What is it, Dr. Nanjo? Even if it's just a thought, please say it. Because Dr. Nanjo looked like he was trying to swallow his words despite having thought of something, I urged him on. After he refused several times, saying that it was just a foolish idea, he finally said it out loud. Well, um, you don't think this actually might be the work of the witch? R ridiculous. There's no way witches exist. The witch is trying to make her case to us. She must be showing us that she can do things that humans cannot. Trying to make us accept her as a witch. To me, this disappearance from the locked room of this entire guest house feels like that kind of message from the witch. I must not think of it. Surely it cannot mean anything. Oh, I'm, I'm frightened. As Dr. Nanjo shook with fear, it looked like he was trying to erase the fearsome thoughts that he kept imagining one after another. When we went downstairs, Auntie Eva and Jessica were enraged, and were making, each making a lot of noise about leaving this place and searching for their respective families. It was a desire that naturally hits those who can no longer see their family. Auntie Eva told Dr. Nanjo and me to stay here, but I shook my head and started walking. I've had enough of being shut up in here. I've started wanting to breathe some outside air. Yeah, and if we're going, let's go right now. I'm sick of ha sick as hell of staying shut up in this place. Let's go find Mom, Dad, and George Nissan as fast as we can. The blood had all risen to Jessica's head. I hope it doesn't set off her asthma. Anyone who wants to stay behind can do that for themselves. But we are going to search outside. What about you, Dr. Nanjo? Gonna watch the place by yourself? N no. Oh, please, allow me to join you. If the alternative was holding up alone in a guest house whose security was by no means guaranteed, it would be better to be in a danger zone as a group of four people. Auntie Ava was holding the gun. Moving separately from her was almost like asking to be made into the next victim. In this way, the four of us decided to leave the guest house. We'd barricaded ourselves in, saying we'd be safe if we did, and then lost eight people. It was almost as though this had been nothing more than a holding cell from which the sacrifices could be killed one after another. We removed the chain, unlocked the front door, and opened it. It was already pitch black out. While there was some lights outside which dimly lit the pathway, they didn't have enough power to illuminate the darkness that some suspicious person was likely to be hiding in. I'm going. If you fall behind, you're on your own, okay? Still holding her gun, Auntie Ava dashed out without an umbrella. Jessica followed after her. After looking at each other, Dr. Nanjo and I chased after them. What in the world is happening in this mansion? On this island? Since yesterday, I've been shut up in the cousin's room in the guest house with the rest of my cousins, so I don't know anything about what's been going on outside. Just what has been happening in those places I don't know about? Outside the room, in the mansion, and on this island, everything is occurring, everything is proceeding, and everything is ending without my knowing it. Somewhere in my heart, I had already begun to give up. Most likely, not one of us will see tomorrow morning. When the seagulls cry, None shall be left alive. Dad! Mom! I wouldn't do so!
something like this. <laughs> Jessica's woeful voice echoed throughout the rose garden. Perhaps it was the intuition of a person who lived on this island. After Jessica had looked in the rose garden where Auntie Rosa and Maria had fallen and seen nothing, she had gone to look in the arbor next. Normally, the arbor was probably a wonderful location to enjoy tea peacefully while appreciating the roses on a good sunny day. Who knows, maybe even Uncle Kraus and Aunt Natsuhi had their days where they relaxed and enjoyed tea together there. In that arbor lay the bodies of Uncle Kraus and Aunt Natsuhi. All right, we finally got their descriptions. Let's read these. <clears throat> Ushiramiya Kraus, corpse discovered in the Rose Garden Arbor. The cause of death is assumed to be strangulation by a cord-shaped object. A stake-shaped weapon was sticking out of his thigh. If not for the epitaph, stakes wouldn't even be needed. What a pain. And Ushiramiya Natsuhi, corpse discovered in the Rose Garden Arbor. The cause of death is assumed to be strangulation by a cord-shaped object. A stake-shaped weapon was sticking out of her calf. Why does the epitaph even need to be followed in the first place? A game? At least they weren't drenched in the rain like Auntie Rosa and Maria had been. But there was no way I could say that out loud to Jessica at the moment. What do you think, Dr. Nanjo? Strangulation, I believe. Uh, take a look at this. On their necks, there are distinct markings that something thin was used to strangle them. Right. I doubt that these things were the primary cause of their deaths. The two stake-like stake weapons decorated with an occult design that were lying on the ground had been found driven into Uncle Krause's thigh area and near Aunt Natsuhi's calf. When we found these sticking out of my parents' foreheads and chest, we had decided to leave them exactly as they were for the police to preserve the crime scene. But Jessica no longer cared about such matters and immediately pulled the stakes out of her parents' forsaken bodies. So we found all five gouge corpses now. In the head, chest, stomach, knee, and leg. <laughs> shit, shit, shit! Freaking kill that murderer! Kill him! <laughs> Everything as far as the eighth, twi eighth twilight is finished now. Is this going to continue on to the ninth twilight? The witch revives and none shall be left alive. Bring it on, damn it! When it says the witch revives... That means the culprit's gonna make his grand appearance, right? Bullshit, no one's gonna be left alive. I'll kill him myself. I'll make sure I'll kill whoever murdered mom and dad with my own two hands. <laughs> Jessica howled furiously, her emotions laid bare. To avoid being crushed by her grief, she could do nothing but resist it with anger. We still haven't found George. Jessica Chun and the rest of you, you can stay here if you want. I'll go to the mansion. Ava-san, we mustn't split up. It's dangerous if we do not all stick together. There's nothing we can do for Nissan or his wife. But George may still be alive somewhere. I have no time to waste here. As Auntie Ava screamed this, Jessica glared at her. Auntie Ava had no more time to bother about the dead. She was more concerned for the safety of her only son, who was yet to be seen. Jessica-chan, you should stay by your father and mother's side. I'll make a short trip to the mansion. Badlerkin and Dr. Nanjo, you two can stay here with her as well. After saying this and leaving no time for debate, Auntie Ava rushed out of the arbor. I called out for her to stop, but there was no way she would listen. However, by now, being alone in this situation meant nothing short of death. If we silently watched her leave, it would be the same as letting her die. As long as Auntie Ava was unwilling to stop, we would have no choice but to follow her. And while it may be cruel to say so, Uncle Kraus and Aunt Natsuhi were already dead, so there was nothing more we could do for them. In the end, we had no choice but to console Jessica and head for the mansion together. Fortunately, Jessica stood up. Perhaps she had been able to draw a line under her grief for the moment. But what had surfaced in its place was an expression like a demon. I'll murder him with my own hands. I'll avenge my parents. Just you wait! Let's go, Butler. If we find whoever did this, don't get in my way. I'm definitely going to kill them. I also have my parents to avenge. Sorry, but this is first come, first served. Yeah, that's right. Let's make mincemeat of that bastard. At my words, Jessica finally seemed to feel like someone had sympathized with her emotions. She still had that dark expression, but I felt Jessica regaining some of her sanity. We took off. 
chasing after Auntie Ava. Through the rose garden, up the stone steps, running at full speed towards the mansion, whose large, intimidating shadow flashed in the lightning. With this, the Epitaph murders had finished the Eighth Twilight, and now, on the Ninth Twilight, the Witch will revive. None shall be left alive. I will most likely lose my life, but at the very le least, I wanted to burn the truth into my eyes. That was on the only thing motivating me to move at that moment. We were able to reunite with Auntie Ava, who was having trouble with the lock to the front door. It seemed that all the blood had risen to Auntie Ava's head. That was probably making her fingers clumsy. It seemed she couldn't even handle the simple task of inserting the key into the lock. Then there was a faint sound, the sound of the door unlocking, just as though it had waited for all of the survivors to unite before opening. It seemed to me as though the malicious mansion was trying to swallow all of the remaining humans at once. The stench that erupted outwards at the instant the door opened. Could it all really be explained as just a smell? It wasn't just the charred smell from Grandfather. I think it may have also contained something like regrets, held by so many dead, including our parents and all of the servants. What did it mean as it billowed out, overwhelming us? Was it the cry of the dead telling us not to enter? However, Auntie Ava didn't even flinch at something like that. And we had we who had to chase after her were forced to step into the mansion despite receiving that message. George! George! If you can hear me, answer! George! Auntie Ava shouted at the top of her lungs. Considering the situation, it's probably far too optimistic to imagine that he's alive. When we also started following Auntie Ava's example and calling George Aniki's name in loud voices, Auntie Ava found something and stopped walking. She was standing in front of the door to the parlor. What is this? D Dr. Nanjo, could you come here for a second? Or what is it? I had heard from the adults about the creepy magic circles that had been drawn on doors such as the one to the parlor. Creepy was the only word to describe that thing, which had been scrawled there with a deep red paint reminiscent of blood that slowly dripped down. However, that had supposedly been there since this morning, wondering why Auntie Ava, who had, already, who had seen it already, would think it odd now, Jessica and I stared at the door. Certainly. I have no memory of numbers such as these being written here. Right, they weren't. The creepy magical text was written here, but not the numbers. From what the two of them had said, only a magic circle had been there this morning. However, right now, there were eight digits newly written in the upper part of the magic circle. O seven one five one one two nine. I didn't know what it meant, but I didn't even want to imagine the thought process of whoever wrote this. It was drawn with what was probably the same paint as the magic circle, but it had clearly been written very recently. The way it had dried and the condition of the color was completely different from the magic circle part. Pfft. I'm sure it just has some magical meaning. It's pointless to rack our brains over it. Jessica intentionally spat those words out in an attempt to wipe out how creepy it was. It could be a magic square. The idea that a ward against evil can reside in an uncertain form of number play. I'm sure you've all heard of the one where adding all of the numbers in each row leads to the same sum. Wasn't that a group of numbers filled inside a square? This is just a single row. I don't have a clue what it could mean. What Jessica, what Jessica Chan said is probably correct. There isn't any point in us thinking about it deeply. Even though she said that, she probably suspected that it might actually mean something. Using an old receipt or something from inside her pocket, Auntie Ava deftly wrote that number down with a short ballpoint pen, because an eight-digit number would probably be a little difficult to memorize unless it had some kind of pattern. Couldn't this be a date or something? A date? What are you talking about? Well, it's probably a coincidence, but my birthday is July 15th. Once I thought that 0715 might refer to July 15th, I figured that if 1129 stood for November 29th, maybe that fit perfectly. Why would your birthday be written in a place like this? And what's up with November 29th? That's what I want to know. 
Still, it's probably just a coincidence. When I thought about it, it started to feel a little creepy. Is November 29th someone's birthday or something? It's not anyone in my family, not Dad or Kyrie-san or Anje. And of course, not my mom either. I cannot think of anything. I don't believe it's Kinzo-san's or Genji-san's birthday. It isn't for my family either. And it isn't for Rosa or Rosa's or Maria-chan's. It's not anyone in mine either. And if it isn't Katon-kun or Shannon's, I always give the servants present on their birthdays, so I know it for all of them. But I don't know anyone who was born on November 29th. Once we started imagining that the eight digits, which we had thought were meaningless, were actually two dates written together, it really started to look that way. However, its true meaning may be something completely different, or there may be no meaning at all. Anyway, since we don't have any real clue, it's probably pointless to stand around here analyzing it. More importantly was the inside of the parlor. This morning, behind each of the doors with the magic circle drawn on them, there had been the body of a victim. And now that a number had been newly added to the door, what new thing had been added inside the parlor? When Auntie Ava tried to open it, she felt the resistance of the lock. She immediately took out one master key and put it in the keyhole. As soon as she opened the door, Auntie Ava let out a high-pitched scream and ran inside. That alone was enough to tell us what had happened inside the room. Dr. Nanjo and I looked at each other, and I shook my head slightly as we entered the parlor. George! George! Speak to me! George! Dr. Nanjo, quickly! George Aniki had fallen alongside Shannon Chan's body. His chest was stained bright red. And from his still-opened eyes, all my condolences to Auntie Ava. But I couldn't pick up any signs of life. Ushirimiya George, corpse discovered in the mansion's parlor. The murder weapon is assumed to be a gun or spear-shaped object. In exchange for his soul, the witch granted an eight-digit number, 0715-1129. When spoken, a small golden land will be opened. After moving to take his pulse, Dr. Nanjo shook his head, wordlessly reporting that George Aniki was dead. <gasps> Brushing him aside, Auntie Eva once again crouched beside George Aniki and started crying at the top of her lungs. With this, Aniki's death, one thing had become certain. The murders would not be ending at the Eighth Twilight. The epitaph was going to be carried out in its complete form, including the Ninth Twilight, and none will be left alive. I'm really starting to lose the plot. For some reason, Auntie Ava's half-insane cries and appearance actually made me cool down. Crestfallen and exhausted, I flopped onto the sofa and plunked my feet on top of the table. Maybe all of these murders have paralyzed my heart. Instead of fright, the stronger emotion I'm feeling is one of complete confusion. Dad and Kyrie-san have died, and starting with the servants, people have been killed off one by one. And at one hell of a pace, too. I don't know what time the first murder started, but I'd say we were probably being killed at a rate of about one person an hour. We believe that the boat will come for us around nine tomorrow. There's still a full twelve hours until then. How many more sacrifices to the witch would there have to be for us to survive? With the four of us, if he, one goes each hour, we won't last any longer than four hours. It's not clear anymore if we'll even last until midnight tonight. Yesterday, after lunch, we came into this parlor. At about the time that discussion had turned to the black tea that Auntie Rosa said she had bought, we kids had started talking about going to take a walk. Maria was fooling around. Didn't Shannon-chan bring us some cookies? She said that Kumasawa-san had baked them or something. I'd probably have laughed my ass off there if it actually had been a cooked mackerel one mixed in with them. That's right. I'll never hear Kumasawa Bachan's mackerel jokes again, will I? Oh yeah. If I only remember stuff about Kumasawa Bachan, that wouldn't be fair to everyone else. Why did Dad and Kyrie-san even go outside? It's not like we'd die from being without food for a day. So why did Gluttony get a hold of them and make them go to get food? I'll bet it was my fearless dad who started complaining about being hungry. 
curious on. You were supposed to be the brakes for my reckless dad. Why didn't you stop him? And what about your daughter, Aje? She's only six years old. You weren't think of, thinking of entrusting her to me, were you? At this point, it's doubtful that I'll even be able to leave this island alive. Stop this! Why are you fighting at a time such as this? Jessica-san, stop! Some kind of commotion was interrupting my thoughts. I looked up to see what it was, and saw that Jessica and Auntie Ava had started fighting each other at some point. No, maybe I should say that Jessica was grabbing at Auntie Ava. You killed my mom and dad! There's no other explanation! Don't be stupid! How would I know anything about what happened to your parents? Who was downstairs in the guest house? You were! Mom and dad were in the downstairs lobby along with you! Who was left alive? Only you! Why? Because you're the fucking murderer, that's why, God damn it! You killed mom and dad, carried them outside, and shamelessly locked the door! Trying to make it seem like it was the frickin' witch's doing! Then why did George go missing? He didn't come downstairs, you know. So did he disappear from upstairs? Who was upstairs? It was you people who were up there! You knew, didn't you? You knew that George slipped out of the mansion. You brazenly made a face as if you didn't know anything! If you would stop George, he would... He would... I'm telling you to stop! Jessica-san was in the cousin's room the whole time, and Ava-san was in the downstairs lobby the whole time, and neither of you are responsible for anything. This is only the sadness of losing your family. The culprit is no one. It's nowhere. It's all just the witch's fault. That's all. So you two, please, stop hating one another. The witch's fault, is it? I wonder if that's a good way to mediate things for now. Yes. I finally understand the meaning of all the doors and windows having been locked from the inside when three whole people evaporated from the guest house. This is what they were after. Making us think the culprit was inside and causing this ugly mutual hatred. Had to be the culprit. The witch's goal. But in that case, how had the culprit locked it from the outside? It's certainly true that the master key had been stolen when Dad's group was attacked. But the doors and windows to the guest house had been constructed so that you couldn't lock them from the outside no matter how hard you tried. So that master key shouldn't mean anything for the guest house locked room. Jessica and Auntie Ava were turned and turning their sadness at losing their blood relatives into anger at the person in front of them. Dr. Nanja was trying to step between them, and I sat haphazardly on a sofa staring up at the ceiling, thinking about things that didn't even matter anymore with a worn-out expression. I just couldn't believe that this was the same parlor that had been so warm and pleasant midday yesterday, for just a short time before the typhoon hit. <coughs> the sudden sound of a gunshot shook me out of my half-asleep trance. Smoke was rising out of the barrel of the gun Auntie Ava held. Jessica was rolling around on the floor, covering both of her eyes. Auntie Ava and Dr. Nanja were looking down at her, shocked. Are, are you all right, Jessica-san? Jessica-san! <laughs> it isn't my fault! This happened because you came at me even after I told you to stop! Hey, hey, hey! What the hell happened? What's going on? Jessica had grabbed at Auntie Ava and it had turned into a scuffle. They had then started fighting over the gun Auntie Ava had been holding, and some movement or other caused the trigger, trigger to be pulled. I didn't know the details about whether the bullet had grazed her or whether she had been burned by the discharge, but whatever the case, Jessica was covering both of her eyes, screaming in pain and rolling around on the floor. It's all right, calm down. It's not a serious wound, so get a hold of yourself. My eyes hurt. It hurts. I can't see. I can't see. Dr. Nanjo lent Jessica his shoulder, saying that he would tend to her in the servant room. The servant room in the mansion apparently had a bed and first aid kit, and was able to function as an infirmary. Damn it! You killed Mom and Dad! I'll kill you! I'll kill you! It, it wasn't me! It wasn't me! Jessica-san, you're aggravating the wound, so please stop struggling! Come, let us go to the servant room. 
Jessica still continued to curse Auntie Eva as her parents' murderer. It seemed that Auntie Eva couldn't conceal her shock at the fact that she had pulled the trigger, even if it had been an accident. It wasn't my fault. The kid jumped at me. That's why this happened. I, I didn't kill anyone. No, forget that. Who killed George? That's right, who killed George? George. George. It isn't my fault. It isn't my fault. Oh, oh, wait a sec. Auntie Eva. Don't go off on your own! I didn't know whether it was because Auntie Eva couldn't stand her mistake, or whether it was because she had lost herself to anger at the person who had killed her only son, or whether it was both of those all mixed together. In any case, she ran out into the corridor, yelling, fearful, and shouting. I was also worried about Jessica's condition, but anyway, right then I couldn't leave Auntie Eva alone. Why would she go off on her own in this mansion of all places? Is she suicidal? Dr. Nanjo took Jessica towards the servant room. I chased after Auntie Eva, dashing into the depths of the mansion. After sitting Jessica on the servant room bed, Nanjo told her several times not to rub her eyes and examined the affected area. The barrel had probably been near her eyes. There was a possibility that the flames from the discharge had damaged her corneas. There was no threat to her life, but it would probably be necessary to have a suitable doctor look at her as soon as humanly possible. Nanjo applied emergency first aid, covering the affected area with gauze and wrapping it with a bandage. As a result, Jessica completely lost her field of vision. Now, pay attention. This wound may hurt or itch, but you must not scratch at it or rub it. When tomorrow comes, let us go to an op ophthalmology. Uh, ophthalmologist as soon as possible. That bitch. She really was trying to kill me. If the angle had been just a little bit off, I'd have been killed by now. I'll definitely turn her into the police. Eva's son would not do such a thing. That was an accident. Accident my ass! She killed mom and dad! There's no way any 19th person or witch exists on this island. She's behind everything. She was the only one on the first floor of the guest house. George Nissan must have seen her kill mom and dad. And she killed him to keep him silent. It's the same with grandfather and the servants. I'm sure she snuck out of the family conference last night and killed all of them. If that's the case, then we'll know as soon as the police investigate. The police are incredible, you know. There's nothing that cannot be understood by a forensic investigator. There's no need for us to suspect or hate anyone. The police will resolve every, everything. So for now, Jessica-san, you should concentrate on resting your body and making things easy on your eyes. If you wrinkle your forehead too much, it will do no good for your eyes, of course. And nothing for your looks, either. What the fuck, Nacho? Indeed, when Jessica had grown agitated in her verbal abuse of Ava, she had naturally started glaring, and the pressure on her eyes hurt her. Jessica herself soon realized that the more she talked, the more the wound would hurt. And regardless of whether she had overcome her suspicions of Ava, she had regained her composure for the time being. She killed them. Mom and Dad. Shannon. You can't on her. She had heard that Canon had been killed in the chapel. Jessica still hadn't seen his face after he had died. Jessica was now less fearful about the fact that she might go blind, and more frightened that the police would carry Canon's corpse away while she still couldn't see, and that she would have to say her final farewell without being able to see his face. Her anger at the culprit, and her sadness at the death of the person she had liked, those mixed emotions provoked her tear ducts. But right now, tears were actually painful for her so she wasn't even permitted to leisurely remember the late Canon's face. Jessica could do nothing but sit on the bed and let her head droop, withstanding the pain. Well, now it's Ava's son I must be concerned for. I hope she isn't too shaken by this. Letting out a small sigh of relief that Jessica had calmed down for the time being, he stuck his head out into the hallway to look for any sign of the others coming back. They met eyes. The, the fucking, like, hello! 
Nanjo, unable to understand who this person was, was bewildered for an instant. I hear that people have lost the power of sight, have zero anti-magic power and zero magic resistance. In other words, you're an isolated pawn right now. Understand what that means? What, what did you just say? There was no possible way that Nanjo could have understood who the person in front of him was. And there was certainly no possible way that he could ever have understood what she had just said. Dr. Nanjo, what's going on? Unable to see, Jessica couldn't tell what was going on except by whatever voice she heard. But since she had heard Nanjo say something with an uneasy tone, she tightened up, thinking that something bad might have happened. S Stop! Please! Please don't kill me! I have a sick grandchild! I can't die here! For mercy's sake, spare me! Ah! Dr. Nanjo! Dr. Nanjo! Jessica couldn't do anything except call out from the bed. Judging by the tone of his voice, Nanjo was in the corridor, being confronted by someone, and he was scared. There was no doubt that at this very moment, his life was being threatened. No! Don't! Ah! On the ninth twilight, the witch revives and none shall be left alive! <laughs> the witch pointed the end of her gold staff at Nanjo. Even though he didn't know what she was planning to do, Nanjo imagined that she must be trying to take his life. Dr. Nanjo! Dr. Nanjo! Who's out there? Answer me! Please! No! Ah! Bang. A sharp sound echoed. And tapered to a point just as sharp, the elongated tip of the golden staff was stuck straight into Nanjo's forehead. Jessica, who had only had her ears to help her try to grasp what was happening, had no clue what was going on. But even so, she was able to realize with that sound, Nanjo had died. Nanjo Teramasa. Corpse discovered in the hallway outside the servant room in the mansion. The murder weapon is assumed to be a gun or spear-shaped object. One last push, and he too would probably have been home free. But at the last possible moment, she did not permit him that. And the person who had killed him was now in the corridor, right in front of the servant room. Furthermore, since she couldn't see, she wouldn't even be able to run away, much less resist. Upon discovering that she was in a life-or-death situation, caught like a rat in a trap, Jessica felt her blood run cold. Oh, Jessica! Poor girl. You've injured your eyes. In that case, you can't even escape, can you? <laughs> I'm gonna play a whole lot with Nanjo's corpse now. When I get bored of that, I'll kill you next and play a bunch more. No, wait. It's not every day that you get blinded, right? I won't wait until I kill you. I'll play with you a bunch before I kill you, too. <laughs> so wait there, shaking for a while, okay? As you try to imagine all the ways I'm playing with Nanjo's corpse. <laughs> Struck with fear, Jessica let out a frail scream. She really wanted to scream in a much louder voice, trying to get someone to help her, but she couldn't. When a person is faced with true fear, it clogs up their throat. Right now, Jessica could barely even breathe. She searched around with her hands, trying to find some way to escape. But even though she knew this room well, just being unable to see it made it look like a locked room of darkness. She bumped into some shelves or something, and some tins of sweets and bottles, and things fell down from them, hitting her on the head. And even as she was now, even protecting her head to block them wasn't working out. She was becoming painfully aware of how very powerless humans become just by losing their sense of sight. Of course, she had no time to appreciate that. She crawled around as best as she could, trying to escape that place. But she kept bumping into things that she didn't understand, getting hit by various falling objects, and it felt to her like the entire room was alive, bullying her and refusing to let her escape. Then she heard footsteps from the presence in the hallway, and then a voice. The person who appeared into the room since Jessica was making so much noise had probably peered into the room. 
What a racket you're making. Sit on the bed and wait quietly like a lady, because I'll give you a wonderful blood-red death costume fitting for a lady of class. Something good enough to make the person who finds you faint, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Just a short while ago, she had sworn that she would kill the culprit if she found them. However, she was now all too powerless. She couldn't do anything except let out feeble screams and crawl around on the floor, bumping her head into the bed and the leg of de the desks. Help! Someone help! Dad! Mom! <laughs> In the corridor, as the witch thought of how to toy with Nanja's life, a single gold butterfly secretly watched that scene from the corner of the hallway. It was Beato, who had barely escaped with her life once before. The gold butterfly softly returned to human form. Its form was faint and transparent like a lace curtain. Even just the power to hold a human form had become scarce for her. Right next to her, Ronove also appeared. Jessica will probably be unable to survive. Although, no one was to be left alive since the beginning. She has grown feelings of love for Canon. I've even toyed with that at times. However, I know that now to I know that now to be something shameful for a witch. Love is the single element. Romantic love is even more pure, more sacred. Though for some reason you hate it very much, milady. Master told me. Magic exists to bring people happiness. I'm sure that I knew that once. And from the moment I forgot that, I was no longer a witch. So I lost the qualifications to be Battler's opponent. Milady, I hesitate to ask, but surely you do not intend to rescue Jessica. That would be dangerous. I understand. Even if I save her, she will become a plaything of the Witch's Banquet when the door to the Golden Land opens. But even so, that would be much more compassionate than the way that person would kill her. The Witch's Banquet steals lives in a terrible way, but it does not do so more than once. It does not toy with life and death. However, she is different. She kills over and over. She kills for fun. There is not even a trace of compassion there. I want to at least save Jessica from that kind of cruel fate. Certainly. By carrying that out, you would probably be praised as a good witch. However, the new Beatrice-sama already views you as hostile, my lady. You are aware you would have no way to escape this time? When I reunited George with Shannon, I finally understood what a witch is, and what magic is. I am a witch. I must be a witch. And I must be acknowledged by Battler as his opponent. And I must make him accept me as a witch this time at last. The road to that goal may be long and difficult. However, if I do not take a step forward here and now, I cannot call myself a witch. I understand your feelings, but how do you plan to rescue her? There are not many forms of magic that your body is capable of now, my lady. Did you not have to borrow George's power even back when you revived Shannon? <laughs> And for that very reason, I may be able to sh save Jessica, at least. Right now, she is begging for Kenon to save her. If I can borrow the power of that emotion, I may be able to knock on the door of Hades once again with my magical power. I'm sure you would be able. However, you would use up all of your magical power. If you were to be spotted by the new Beatrice, Sama, you would should truly be without a method of escape. I'm no longer your butler, my lady. Understand that I cannot assist you even if the situation worsens. I know. By now, I have toyed with and taken more lives than I can count. So I may not be able to compensate for that sin, except by saving the same number of lives. I have nothing to lose in the first place. I am just a golden butterfly who has passed its name and magic power on, and who is no longer accepted as a witch. What about Butler, Summer? You're partway through a game with him. He had said that he would wait until you returned, the lady. Is it all right for you to expire here? You have a duty to return to the seat across from Badler, Sama, my lady. For that very reason. If there is a life that only I can save, I choose to save it. 
and I will be accepted as a witch. I must be a witch. If this is a test, it is a very childish one, unfitting for the evils I have committed until now. Go, hide yourself, Ronave. Watch what may be the final magic of a single butterfly who used to be called a golden witch. Certainly. Please, show me magic. It will not disgrace the name of the Golden Witch. I pray that it will not be your last. Go, my friend. If there is enough ink, pen the story of my foolish life and hand it to some fool attempting to walk the same path. Farewell, Ronave. We're getting to one of my favorite scenes in the entire visual novel right now. <laughs> and uh, it will soon be the first play of one of my favorite tracks in the OST as well. Cannot can Where are you? Where are you? Help me. Help me. <laughs> My lady, I am always waiting by your side. <laughs> cannot good. Cannot good. Jessica thought that she had heard Cannon's voice. She looked around with unseeing eyes, but of course, there was no way for her to see anything. On the contrary, that action caused her to hit her head to hit the desk again. <laughs> can I go? Can I go? Help me! Help me! Yes, my lady. I will help you. Can I go? You were alive. This time, she thought that she heard his voice clearly. Jessica jumped in surprise, banging her head against the desk once again. Milady, please, calm your heart and listen. Unfortunately, I'm not alive. Huh? <laughs> I've already died. However, that witch came to tell me, came to me to tell me of your peril. Then she gave me only a short period of time to help you, Milady. Please, calm your heart even more. If you do, my form will become visible even to you, Milady. Jessica obeyed those words. She chased all idle thoughts from her head and relaxed her breathing. June Pop 45 with the $2. With love, you can hear it? Perhaps so. Her heart actually felt like it was going to explode after hearing the voice of the loved one she thought, she was, th she thought was dead. She resisted that with all of her strength. When she did, she could feel that Kanon Kun really was right in front of her. Even though she was unable to see, somehow, she was still able to sense him clearly. Can you see me, milady? Yeah, I can see. I can definitely see you, Kanon. I exist only as a spirit, so I cannot touch you, milady. I cannot do anything except talk to you like this. I'm a weak existence which can do nothing more than that. But I should be able to be of some aid to you, milady. Just words? That's all? I can't touch you, Kenokun? I'm now even more fragile than smoke from a candle. So much so that if one of the living such as you were to touch me, I'd be wiped away instantly. So please, don't try to touch me. Because I am also holding back my desire to touch you, my lady. <laughs> yeah. More importantly, my lady, please listen well. The new Golden Witch is the owner of a cruel heart. She will surely try to make you meet with a horrible end. You must escape from this room and hide. How? I can't see anything. Quiet. I will be your eyes, my lady. Please move in accordance with my instructions. First, please crawl three steps from there, and then stand up. You're currently under the desk, my lady. If you stand there, you'll hit your head. Th that was under the desk? I got it. One, two, three. Standing up. Well done. Next, 
Please to turn towards nine o'clock. Yes, well done. <laughs> this is pretty embarrassing. Ah! Ow, ow, ow. Are you all right? Does your wound hurt? No, I'm fine. What next? Jessica thought that if this was a dream, she didn't want to wake up. And if she were allowed to, she would have wanted to take off the bandage covering her eyes and see him. However, if she did that, surely Canon would vanish like a frail candle smoke, just like he himself had said. She was afraid of that. So she satisfied herself with just being able to hear his words once more, repressing her desire to see him, to hold him. So what hurt her eyes now were tears of gratitude. Tears of gratitude for the god, or else which, who had given her this miraculous moment. Is this okay? If we keep talking like this, won't we be noticed by her? Won't our voices be heard? I have erected a stealth barrier. If you don't make any loud noises or speak noisily, no one will notice. That's why no one can notice my presence. I, I don't really get it. But anyway, we'll be okay as long as we stay quiet, right? What should I do next? Please walk ten steps, slowly, in the direction you're facing. You'll touch the sofa. Please continue along that. Do it slowly. Stay calm. Believe my words. Sure. It's weird. Even though it was so scary not being able to see. When you're with me, Kenon Ken. It isn't scary at all. Yes, that's the sofa. Trace it to the left while advancing slowly. There's a table just to the left. Be careful not to bump it with your shins. It was a very, very peculiar and magical team effort. Even though she would be killed in an instant if she was noticed by the terrible witch, there was no fear in Jessica's heart right then. She was being protected and guided by Canon, who she thought she would never be able to meet again. It was probably only a momentary miracle. But even so, Jessica was deeply grateful for it. If she hoped for too much, she was sure that he would disappear. So in order not to break this transient miracle, and in order to engrave this moment into her heart for all of eternity, she slowly, slowly, continued to walk, obeying Canon's voice. All right, if you walk 10 more steps, you'll exit the servant room. Then, please turn to face nine o'clock and keep walking very slowly. Put your hand on the wall to your right and keep on following that. I'll take you to a safe room. If I go there, will you leave me again, Canon? Canon didn't answer, but even his lack of an answer was enough to let her know that was the truth. Then, no, I don't want to go. If you stay here, you'll be killed by the witch. That's all right. If I'm killed, I can go to the world where you are, Canon. Can the lady, please be reasonable. For the dead such as myself, the human world is too bright and painful. So I cannot stay for long. So, my lady, with this time that I'm allowed, please permit me to guide you to a safe place. And after that, I will stay with you until my time runs out. Is that the best you can do, Ken Unkun? Yes. And in exchange, I will stay by your side for every second I can, my lady. The whole time I will be with you. And I will talk with you, my lady. Talk about what? What would you like to me to talk about? Anything that you're willing to. Well then, I'll tell you the story of a cowardly servant boy without courage. I thought a foolish and pitiful boy who felt love for a lady as radiant as the sun, and who, even though those same feelings were confessed to him, lost to his cowardice, in the end was not able to be true to himself while he still lived. Yeah. Then, I want to tell one too. The story of a cowardly girl who couldn't muster her courage to keep telling the boy she loved just how much she loved him. And uh, about how God gave her a miracle to be reunited with that boy. And how, when she was given one more chance to muster up her courage, she did. I also want to hear that. So for that reason as well, let us go to a safe place. If I could be with you, Ken Unkun, I would walk however long, however far, 
I don't need eyes anymore. If you told me to step forward, I'd even take a step off a cliff. Thank you. Well then, my lady, let us go. The first ten steps. No, not like that. Not unless you call me Jessica. Understood. Well then, Jessica, take the first ten steps. Yeah, can I get Quietly, quietly, Jessica and Cannon snuck slowly out of the servant room. Directly around the corner, the witch could be seen cruelly looking down upon Nanjo's corpse, but the witch did not even notice their presence. However, Ronave, who was waiting at her side, met Cannon's eyes. Cannon thought, oh no, grimacing and blocking Jessica with his back. However, Ronave did not inform his master, as though it had been his imagination that he had ever spotted them in the first place. He pretended to know nothing. No, maybe he did He did appear to chuckle. From a finger on one of Renove's hands, which were joined behind his back, a single small gold butterfly appeared, flying in front of Canon as though guiding him. It was undetectable by the master he served. Canon was surprised at the magic that butterfly held, because it was far more powerful than the stealth barrier Canon had. He may not have known, but that power had originally been Renove's. An imitation of that had been given to Kanon by Kinzo, and that was what Kanon was using now. As that butterfly of stealth magic scattered gold scales, it grew smaller, bit by bit. It probably wouldn't last long. But without a doubt, even that would buy them enough time to get far away from the cruel witch. Alright, my lady. Let's follow that wall and keep walking. On and on. And on. Yeah. If I can be with you, Kenon, I'll keep on walking, on and on, as far as you want to go. Led and protected by the small gold butterfly, the two who were separated by the wall between life and death slowly walked away towards the end of the corridor. There was no way that the evil witch would have any magic to notice their flight. Until they had, dis until they had already disappeared down the other end of the corridor, the witch never noticed that Jessica had vanished. By the time the gold butterfly that Ronave had cast out evaporated completely, Jessica had reached the parlor. Even though she would have been able to make it this far in no time if she had been able to see, as she was now, it had been a long, long adventure. Now, milady, we've reached the parlor. I will now take you to the bundle of curtains by the window. If you hide in there, you'll surely be safe. Inside the curtains? Not bad. I used to hide in there a lot long ago. Beatrice Sama. Hm? Canon called the witch's name. Jessica looked around in surprise, but being unable to see, she obviously couldn't find the witch. Beato had appeared once again with a faint form. Canon squared off against the evil witch, but Beato's expression was soft and actually pitying. I don't understand what kind of whim drove you to revive me. Your feelings elude me. It was a whim, and nothing more. No, this is how witches should be. It took me 1,000 years to realize that. That is all. A foolish tale. H who? Who's there? Milady, be quiet. She's the witch, Beatrice. I am in her debt, because she let me be with you one more time. The witch, Beatrice. I am unimportant. I suggest you instead make haste in hiding that girl in the shadow of the curtains. You probably do not have much time left. You should probably you should spend it in a final conversation with Jessica. A secret meeting inside a bundle of curtains. You two have quite the sense of style. <laughs> um, thank you, Beatrice. Thank you for letting me be with Kanonkun. Jessica didn't know where Beato was, so she said that while facing in the wrong direction. Perhaps she found that fu because she found that funny, Beato snickered. <laughs> I will now leave this room to the pair of lovers. 
Evil witches have no need for tales of love, you see. Allow me to retreat. Beatrice, Soma. Thank you very much. <laughs> no need to thank me. You know well that something like this isn't enough to compensate for all of the evil I have done. I give my gratitude to good witches as a parting gift. I don't care about what happened before now, or what will happen in the future. All I know is that, in this very moment, you are without a doubt a good witch. You flatter me, Furniture. The next time we meet, I may be an evil witch who will not betray your expectations. And with that, farewell. Beato left the parlor and closed the door, and mustering the last of her remaining magical power, she sealed the door. The fact that those two had escaped into here would eventually be noticed, and now that the ninth twilight had been reached, no matter how much they struggled, their inescapable fate had already been decided. However, until that final moment, they should be permitted the time to speak with each other of their love. The witch poured out all of her magical power to protect their time together. so that no one would be able to defile their alone time together until the final moment. Just then, Beato perceived something. Her body had been detected by a magical searching technique. The cruel-hearted witch's furniture had sniffed this place out. So, boorishness is the witch's way of doing things. To think that she doesn't even intend to allow the two young ones to speak to each other of their love. <laughs> Forty-five, data received. Comparing target. Confirmed as the predecessor, Lady Beatrice. Analyzing parlor defensive wall. Multi-layered defensive wall, 72 layers. Attack barrier and ma magic reactive armor. Sniping into the parlor is impossible. Data link to 410. 410, data received. <laughs> Man, we've just got a... <clears throat> the predecessor first, yeah. Great, Lady Beatrice. Permission to fire, please. Go ahead and shoot. Oh, and avoid her vital areas. There's something I want to ask that old hag. Four ten, firing. <laughs> the Chester sisters' gold bow released a golden snake. It crawled down the corridor, starting from the front of the servant room, drawing a soft serpentine curved trajectory as it made for the parlor. and struck through Beato's chest. <laughs> Gold butterflies gathered, and the cruel witch showed herself there along with her furniture. Predecessor Sama, you will not get away with obstructing us a second time. Uh, uh, I never thought I would. Still, the Chester sisters really have gotten rusty. To think that they failed to bring me down, and twice at that. Ronave spoke in a manner fitting for the witch's butler. As she pushed her pain aside, Beato grinned and spoke back. M my apologies, predecessor Sama. We were ordered to avoid vital areas. As soon as there's an order, we can pierce you at any time. Through your earring holes, your belly button hole, any hole you like. <laughs> The gold snake that had shot through Beato grew even longer, drawing a helix like a morning glory vine, and awaited its next order. It was ready to pierce a vital spot as soon as the merciless witch told it to. For what reason would someone like you, who is even more brutal than me, make them avoid my vital areas? New Beatrice. I wanted to ask you. I don't know what trick you used to escape, but we were under the impression that we had taken you out, you know. Why is it even though that you could have escaped by hiding, you took the risk of appearing again? It can't be that you just came back to protect those two young people, surely. Well, who knows? <laughs> and just a second ago, why'd you do something as soft as reviving the lovers and reuniting them? The more I hear about you, the more I learn that I don't even reach up to your feet as an incarnation of evil. If you're like that, why did you suddenly start acting so mildly? That's what I wanted to ask. <laughs> because I am brutal. I am fickle. How could there be any meaning in asking that? Chiaster sisters, sew her. 
when she ordered that, the gold snake that was curled in a helix and suspended in space moved as fast as a real snake going after its prey and pierced Beato's body multiple times from the front and the back, its golden tail drawing an X shape. As the ruthless witch had ordered, it drew a cross stitch through Beato's chest. The gold thread made a squeaking sound and tormented Beato. Rather than a gold snake aiming for its prey, it waited for orders in midair as if it were a sewing needle ready to sew Beato. When it comes to you, there's no way it was a whim. I've heard about you, and I've learned. You're such an incarnation of evil that I don't even rise up to your feet. I thought I was truly a fitting successor for you. But you've always been in the way. You always say warm, pleasant things that shock me. What changed you? You explored the depths of evil for 1,000 years. So I'll let you live just to find out what happened to overturn that millennium. If you want to know, I suggest you two spend a thousand years finding out. <laughs> so her. Beato's chest was once again sewn with a golden cross stitch. It tightened once again, squeezing fresh blood from Beato's chest. The intense pain it caused ran in conflict with its beauty to the eye. You might actually be another one of those types who disappear when they die and doesn't leave a corpse. So I'll kill you slowly. But if you answer my questions honestly, I'll kill you gently. I'll give you a splendid, gorgeous death perfect for my predecessor. I'll sink you in a coffin filled with water and roses. Isn't that wonderful? And you still won't talk about the reason for your change of heart. <laughs> Not answering what she asked is also one of the pleasures of an evil witch. So her, twice. <laughs> of course you don't have to answer. After all, that way I get to torture you. <laughs> the endless magic, the infinite magic, truly is wonderful. When you think about it, this world is finite in every way. The infinite cannot exist in the human world. Because God is infinite, he deprived the human world of all infinity so that he could look down upon it. So in other words, the power of the infinite is the power of God. A wonderful power where the more you play with it, the more fun ways of playing you find. You used that power as you pleased for 1,000 years and went on a rampage. Why are you having a change of heart only now? Don't tell me you just miss it now that you handed it over to me. Oh, are we getting it? Are they playing it? Oh. How could I miss it? The endless magic is not magic as you believe it to be. True magic is a deep abyss that you most certainly cannot reach. And you realized what that is? What is it? <laughs> Wander around for a thousand years without realizing that, you foolish witch. So her, three times this time! Iconic laser with the ten dollars. Thanks for being born. God, fuck. This scene's probably gonna get me. <laughs> they continued embroidering Beato's chest with the gold thread. It tightened even more, causing Beato more and more pain. Well, whatever. I'm not the least bit interested anymore in what deep understanding some good as dead hag came to. I'm bored now, so I'll kill you quickly. If I kill you, the barrier to the parlor will be undone. Then I'll torture Canon and Jessica to death a whole bunch of times. Being able to have two lovers as my toys at the same time. Sounds fun, right? <laughs> Kill her! Without missing by a millimeter, the gold sewing thread shot through Beato's heart. That intense pain was worse than all of the pain before that put together. Beato finally remembered the actual feeling of dying which she had forgotten over 1,000 years. But she couldn't die. She must not die. If she died, the two in the parlor would be handed over to the brutal witch. So she definitely couldn't die. She resolutely refused to die. 
New Beatrice. I have a request. The lover's meeting between the two in the parlor is to be short. In the amount of time an hourglass can measure, Canon will probably disappear to Hades. Would you please allow them that much time? No way! Tearing apart two who love each other is fun, isn't it? You're the one who said it, so I want to try it! <laughs> In that case, I cannot allow you to enjoy that pleasure. It is fun tearing lovers apart. Right? I'm sure it must be, right? So don't get in my way! Sow her more! So, so, so! Meh <laughs> 410, understood. The merciless gold sewing needle sewed its golden thread through Beato's heart over and over again. However, no matter how much it tightened, that heart did not stop. This isn't nearly enough. You'll have to do better than this to kill me. What are you doing? Make this old hag stop talking! Kill her quickly! But we are! Even though we've sewn her heart in place several times, her heart won't stop. Are you immortal? Of course not. I've handed the Endless over to you. There is a limit to how many more times my heart can beat. However, if by making it beat just one time extra, I can give the two in this room even slightly longer to themselves, I'll continue that meager resistance for all eternity. So, keep sewing until her heart stops beating! Doesn't she die? This is impossible! Her heart is sewn in place. So why doesn't it stop? Fine then. We'll make her heart explode from the inside, nyeh. How pitiful. And you could have died cleanly if you hadn't resisted us. The gold needle and thread made round trips over and over again as they spoke and still, Beato didn't expire. The barbarous witch was at last starting to turn pale at how unnatural this was. What in the world are you? <laughs> you probably cannot understand, even if I didn't understand. But still, somehow or another, it seems that this is true magic. In other words, I have now become it. I have become a true witch. Center of explosion stabilized in hard interior. Primed and ready. Detonate. Hi, Lambda Delta. There was a deafening sound and gold leaf and a flutter of gold butterflies were scattered around the area. Beato's chest had opened wide from the inside, and from that, gold butterflies and gold leaf erupted, staining the surrounding area gold. Then, Beato's body crumpled, like a puppet whose strings had been cut. She crumpled and sank to the floor. However, in the air, a gold heart tied by gold threads floated and continued to beat. When the Chiester sisters saw that, they fell on their behinds in shock. Somehow, even though Beato had become nothing more than a heart, it still kept beating, continuing to protect the barrier to the parlor. It was an immeasurably immense magical power, impossible to measure. In other words, infinite and endless. I'm the Endless Witch, right? Why is this old hag? Still alive after all of this! Chiesta sisters! Smash that heart! Quickly! 
It's impossible! My apologies! We cannot do it! It's probably impossible. No number of people could crush that heart, much less the likes of the soldiers who serve under His Highness of the Dragon King. In that case, and in this witch like me should be able to crush it, right? My god is- my power is a god's power! I'm afraid to say that your power cannot leave a single scratch on Beatrice Summer's endless nature. Just- but, what do you mean by that? In the same way that there is no light without knowledge of shadows, there is also no endless without knowledge of the limited. Before Milady Beatrice's true endless power, your flimsy magical power is very, very lacking. What is that supposed to mean? <laughs> the cruel witch stepped back in surprise. It was more transparent than a lace curtain. But Beato's form, no, Beatrice's form, was still standing there. Even after taking on this wretched appearance, she would not allow evil through that door. At that time, a shadow just as faint as Beatrice stood behind her. It was Canon. Beatrice Sama, thank you very much. I will not forget this favor you have done for me. <laughs> I shall hear those words again when the number of my favor surpasses the number of grievances I have caused. Wait your turn. Yes. Truly, thank you very much. And Beatrice Sama, you have also done enough. Please, be at peace. Is that so? So this is enough. <laughs> What's going on? Why are you guys calling that predecessor hag Beatrice? Beatrice is my name, right? It should be my name as the new golden witch and endless witch, right? How dare you assume Beatrice Sama's is name? I'm afraid to say that the name of Beatrice Sama should be taken by the person who can be crowned as the Endless Witch. By now, the term predecessor refers to you. <laughs> what did you say? Farewell, Canon. I'll meet you soon anyway. In a new nightmare. In the new nightmare of a new night. I will once again be your companion, Beatrice Sama. With that, if you would excuse me. Canon's form grew faint, and he disappeared into thin air. After watching him go, Beatrice's form also grew faint, and before disappearing, it slumped over onto the floor. Then, there was a splat. The golden heart which had been floating in midair had lost its sparkle, become blood-stained flesh, and fallen to the ground. How frail it was. It was ragged and full of holes. But until just now it had sparkled so much, and had continued to beat forcefully. That heart still barely managed to beat. However, it was only a matter of time before it stopped. Beatrice, whose form had become fragile and faint like incense smoke, lay on the floor, steadily watching her own heart. There, the cruel witch could be seen. How are you endless? Face reality! You're collapsed in a heap on the floor, aren't you? Endlessness with limits. That's a contradiction. It can't possibly exist. This is the limit of your magic. The limited is inferior to the infinite. Beatrice no longer had the energy even to respond. No, in fact, it was doubtful whether the words of the cruel witch even reached her ears. If you're an endless witch, try standing up! Well, you can't, can you? Why do you think you can't stand? It's because you aren't an endless witch! The merciless witch poked Beatrice's heart with her fingernail. Beatrice had no words with which to respond to that provocation. However, instead of words, she returned a single expression. It looked insulting only to the cruel witch. Because she had gently curved her mouth and smiled.
Footsteps were approaching that place. There was no way she could mistake them. That boisterousness of boisterous noise of shoes against the ground was the sound of Battler's footsteps. Battler, it is it. <laughs> For all my talk, I've ended up like this. I've been trying to become the true witch you talked about in my own way. Yeah, I was watching. Hey, have I now been able to become a witch? Have I earned the qualifications to become your opponent? No good. Battler said that unbelievably bluntly. Taking a painful breath, Beatrice saw that and sneered at herself as though she should have expected it. <laughs> Is that so? It seems I still have an uphill struggle ahead of me on the road to becoming a true witch. However, I will not surrender. Just like you never surrendered to my torture, I will definitely become a true witch and be accepted as your opponent. Yeah, it's no good. It's no goddamn good at all. You aren't my opponent. The brutal witch raised her foot high. Below it was Beatrice's frail heart. Die, you old hag! See if you can show how endlessly you are after you've been mushed to bits! I am the witch! I am the golden witch Beatrice! Die! Yeah, it's no good! It's no goddamn good at all! Here we fucking go! Get in your seat. My opponent isn't Beato. It's you! Butler! Oh, what kind of magic is this? Who cares? It doesn't matter. Chester sisters! 45, understood. Individual firing. 410, understood. Die, Battler! The Chiester sisters each readied their own golden bows and fired golden arrows. The two only pulled the bowstring together when using precision guidance. If they were fighting against an enemy before their eyes, they fired their bows at the same time. And the power was no different from what it normally was. What? It, it was deflected? There's no barrier! It was deflected with resistance alone! F 45 target me measurement! Uh, 45 understood! Huh. What? Th this is... Am I broken? The measurement is going berserk? Uh, Anti-magic resistance! Endless 9! Even mythical class magical attacks have no effect on the target! The warheads of the Golden Bows could penetrate any magical armor with their mutual corrosion. When attempting to block that using the anti-magic resistance stat, even something with eight digits wouldn't escape penetration. Furthermore, even among the famous gods that appeared in myth, there are not many that reach an, a, a resistance stat of nine digits. For that reason, nine digits were enough to measure almost all imaginable values. Battler had filled all nine of those digits with nines. How foolish. When Battler Sama serious, mere magical arrows cannot even succeed in making his hair tremble. The Chiester sisters dropped their golden bows in shock. To this Battler, it felt even less perceptible than two dragonflies pa passing by his sides. What the hell are you guys doing? You playing or something? <laughs> M monster If your name's not Ava, get the hell out of here! And you get in your seat, you goddamn fake witch! I'll tear that mask of yours off! 
The Chiester sisters couldn't hide their fear at Battler's ferocity, and they backed up as though they had been struck. Beatrice watched this scene in shock. B Battler, what is this supposed to be? Just what you're seeing. My opponent isn't you. It's her! The imposter over there who's assuming your name! <laughs> I'm fighting against witches, and my method of denying them is to make anyone who calls themselves a witch my opponent and crush them. I've seen more than enough of your arrogance. Then, Battler's eyes grew as sharp as blades as he fixed his eyes on the cruel witch. Magic my ass. Witch is my ass! You aren't a witch! I'll rip that mask off and tear it to shreds! Virgilia, get ready to fight! Understood. Preparations are complete, so go whenever you're ready. Beatrice, you stay back and rest. Mm -mm. Beata looked at Battler timidly. She still hadn't been acknowledged as his opponent. Was she qualified to watch the game board from the sidelines? Beato, stay back and watch. I'll tear it off. I'll take this fake witch completely apart. I won't let someone like this call themselves a witch. You protected the honor of true witches. I have... You don't need to say anything. On your behalf, I'll teach her that the name of the Golden Witch definitely isn't that cheap. That... Those are the general rules. Thanks, Renove. I get most of the rules now. I see. You can't win with magic, so you came to face off with me in a world where victory is decided by something other than magic. Foolish people. You really think you can win against me with this twisted logic? Damn right I do. I'll crush all of your twisted logic, Aunt Ava. Uh, I am not Ava. That is the name of the old shell that I shed. I am a true witch born inside of her. Don't try to trick me. Your true form isn't a witch or anything like it, but a flesh and blood human. The human culprit, Ushiramiya Ava. Virgilia, re reconstruct the second twilight. Hey, remember that track I talked about? It's playing now. I did this. Understood. On the second twilight, Rosa and Maria were killed in the Rose Garden. We make our first move by applying the Ava by applying the Ava culprit theory. Huh? Ridiculous. Come, arise. Try to remember. What form did Ushiramiya Hideyoshi have? What? What's this supposed to be? It's summoning of the dead. It's easy for a witch to bring even the dead to, to the stand for testimony. As Uncle, an Uncle Hideyoshi who could see right through was summoned. Magic sure is convenient. He looked as though he couldn't see what was going on here, almost like a person on the other side of the TV. Witness summons, assure me a Hideyoshi's testimony. Come, Hideyoshi, speak. I was taking care of Ava in the room the whole time. Ava didn't leave the room either, of course. Aunt Ava, around here, testimony that isn't red has been worth crap. I demand that he repeats it again in red. Oh yeah, that's right. Sure, say it in red for him. I was in the room the whole time, both before and after the time period of the crime. See, look, this makes it impossible for Ava to be the culprit. How will you counter this? Ridiculous. That move's so pathetic I could yawn. Beato never used such childish tricks, not even once. Butler. Repetition requested. Aunt Ava was also in the room the entire time, before and after the time period of the crime. Uncle Hideyoshi was just there to create an alibi. You made Uncle stay in the room and stealthily snuck out. If that isn't true, this guy should be able to say so in red. De decline repetition. Hideyoshi's testimony is sufficient. There's no need to repeat that, right? She's back down. Mercy is unnecessary. This is check. Yeah, I'll take it. This opponent's a piece of cake! Check! Maybe Uncle Hideyoshi didn't leave the room the whole time, but saying he was taking care of you the whole time is a barefaced lie! Therefore, no alibi exists for you! You had a chance to slip out of the room and kill Auntie Rosa and Maria. If you think you can dodge that, try proclaiming in red that Auntie Ra Ava didn't take a step outside of the room! You can't, right? Checkmate! What? What is that? I... I don't get it! 
Sorry, Auntie. Even if you aren't used to the rules, beating your opponent down with all your strength is how this game is played. Isn't it, Beato? Mm -mm. The Witch Sard resigns. Let us continue on to the next game. Next is the fourth Twilight, through the sixth Twilight. It seemed that the witch still didn't understand how to approach things, and was losing her composure and irritation. She was probably also angry that a shot had been taken at her while she still didn't get what was going on. But I won't go easy on her at all. Just like she didn't go easy on the victims at all, I won't go the slightest bit easy on her! Virgilia, next crime! Let's reconstruct the incident with Dad and the rest! Understood. Rudolf Kyrie and Hideyoshi. These three people went to the mansion and were killed there. My move won't change. Aunt Ava, you are the culprit. This time, you didn't even have an alibi from Uncle Hideyoshi. You claim that you were sleeping in that room all by yourself. But that's untrue. If you can proclaim it in red, just try it. I refuse. So tell me then. Ava is just a woman. And the people who were killed there were three adults holding two guns, right? How did she kill them all by herself? How did she do it with those stakes as weapons? How is the stake shooting device that everyone keeps talking about constructed? Explain that! As long as you can't explain it, even if Ava doesn't have an alibi, it doesn't mean that it was possible for Ava to commit murder. Decline explanation. It's a devil's proof. You can't refute the existence of an unknown murder technique or an unknown weapon just because it's impossible to explain. In short, even if I can't explain how the stake shooting device is constructed, that doesn't disprove its existence. Is that madness allowed? Devil's proof. Valid. Agreed. Devil's proof. Valid. Bather can, can claim that a stake shooting device exists without bearing the responsibility of explaining how it is constructed. The witch side cannot object to this move. N not bad. How pushy. <laughs> well, there's this ill-natured witch who trained me well. This is check. Got it? Try saying in red that Auntie Ava didn't take a step outside of that room. That's right. There's no way you'll be able to say it. If you can't say it, it's over. Checkmate! Th that's so irrational! This is messed up! Those are the rules of this game. How about some black tea first? We also have some delicious cookies, you know. I don't need all of that! Oh, that pisses me off! So you fight like a coward just because you can't win with magic! Don't get irritated. Drink some black tea or something. I'll take mine straight. What about you, Beato? Uh, I'm fine. More importantly, Battler, don't let your guard down. Your opponent is merely unfamiliar with the rules. It will start in earnest once your opponent gets the feel for it. But I'll crush her. I'll thoroughly crush her. That's because she isn't a witch. If I accept her as a witch, all of your stubbornness counts for nothing. I don't care what kind of irrational argument or twisted logic I have to use. I'll crush her with all of my heart and soul! Battler's side then stuck with the Ava culprit theory to explain Kraus and Natsuhi. The seventh and eighth Twilights in the exact same way. At that time, there had been no one on the first floor of the guest house except for Ava and the victims. As before, no one could establish an alibi for Ava. At the time, Ava had claimed that they disappeared while she was in the lavatory. But nothing supported that, and the, witches, and the witch side couldn't repeat that in red, either. With the same argument as she had used to ask about the construction of the shooting machine, the witch side asked once more how Ava could have strangled both of them at the same time, but all by herself. But of course, Battler splendidly counterattacked by refusing to explain because of the Devil's Proof. Under the storm and stress of Battler's spirit, the witch side was completely swallowed up and was forced to resign three times during the short period of time she had to grasp the rules. <laughs> I see. I'm finally starting to get the knack of it. Oh god, fucking Mirage Coordinator, let's fucking go! I love this track. I won't let things go the way that you want them to anymore. This time, let me take the initiative. Runove, reconstruct the fourth through the six twilights. Pick out a Shiromiya Kyrie. For now, let me return to the murders of Rudolf, Kyrie, and Hideyoshi for the fourth through six twilights. Our Habaki Game with the $5 have to donate since this is my favorite song in the soundtrack. There are many like them, but this one's mine. Very good choice. 
What is she thinking? Why wouldn't she return once more to a board? Why would she return once more to a board state she had already res resigned from? I see. This is a rare attack which you do not use. Be careful. At the time, the survivors were barricaded in the guest house. They didn't have any food, but out of curiosity and concern for their safety, they were at least prepared to go without eating until the next day. However, in the end, three of them went out for food. That's right. In the end, three people went outside to get food. I'll add in some red as I speak, because it'll be a pain otherwise. Curie didn't think that they needed food, since going without food for about a day wouldn't kill them. She claimed that they should not leave the guest house. And yet, she herself suggested that they leave the guest house to get food. Daniel the Spaniel with the five pounds. I'm having so much fun, fun, folks. Yeah, it, this part rules. Isn't this a contradiction? Yes, a spectacular contradiction. It contradicts Kyrie's pattern of behavior. That contradiction was created by me, using magic. In other words, I controlled Kyrie using magic and made her say that to lure the sacrifices outside. R ridiculous There's no way that kind of magic exists. It's a devil's proof, though. Just because you don't know about that magic doesn't disprove its existence. And I don't bear the responsibility of acting out that magic for you. And yet, you still have no room to counter this argument. <laughs> I wonder if it's alright to fight this way. Yes, it's truly a spectacular move. Battler Sama, your response if you please. You sure have brought in a weird argument. Run that by me again? She has made a play against Ashura Mia Kyrie's pattern of behavior. As has already been explained, Kyrie's pattern of behavior had her saying that they should not go outside and head to the mansion in order to get food. Oh, whoops. Yet even so, she took the initiative and took the contradictory action of suggesting to go get food. As long as you cannot explain this contradiction, this violent move claims that it was due to magic. Well, Curious Sun probably thought that too in the beginning, but she probably uh, thought about various things midway and had a change of heart deciding that food really was necessary. It would be a problem if due to hunger we had no energy when we needed it most and, well... She's claiming that this change of heart is due to magic. In short, while it may be extremely difficult, you must explain the reason for Curious change of heart. What? What? But that's asking me what was inside Curious Sun's own head. Can't I also summon Curiousan's ghost and question her or something? Beato, can't you call Curiousan here or something? She cannot. That's a move permitted only to the witch side. Sorry. Ah, uh, damn it! She was probably uh, thinking of us kids and, um, on the whole, thought that food really was necessary and. You must make that claim objectively. You m require tangible evidence of the specific reason for which Kyrie changed her mind and decided that food really was necessary. For example, if someone heard her say that, or if it was written down somewhere. <laughs> Too bad. No reason for her changing her mind was ever told to anyone, nor was, nor was one ever written down. Therefore, you can only speculate as to what was inside Kyrie's mind. So it is impossible to prove. You don't have a single counter to my move. It's your turn to resign now, Battler Coon. It's possible to hypothesize endlessly as to the reason behind her change of heart. And, to, and it is impossible to crush all of those endless possibilities. A detestably spectacular move. If Battler Sama were to have a method of countering, it could probably only be that move. L what move is that? Well now, I wonder what kind of move it could be. I have a feeling that it was Milady's specialty, but I cannot remember. Quit being stingy and tell me! Beatrice, there's no answer that will be given to those who stop thinking themselves. Think. Think in your own way. Why don't you just resign right now? And I'll corner you even more with Red. Until the last instant before she died, Curie maintained her pattern of behavior, which states, I won't go to the mansion to get food. And yet she took the initiative and headed for the mansion. She was pushing a cart, trying to carry food. Why that contradiction? Because I controlled her with magic. This is proof that my magic exists and that I am a witch. Shut your damn mouth! Are you saying that she never even changed her mind? The whole time until she died? Curious on thought we didn't- we don't need food? I won't go to the mansion? Then why did she step forward herself and say that they should go get food and go to the mansion? 
Are you saying that Kyrie-san was being controlled with magic? That's stupid! How am I meant to break through this magic? If only Kyrie-san were here and just told us the reason behind her change of heart. No, I've already been told and read that she never even changed her mind. What should I do? There's no move that the human side can counter with. The more I learn about this game, the more advantageous the rules seem for a witch, don't they? Even if the witch loses in a lot of areas, if she can win in just one with that alone, she can flaunt her existence. In other words, Batlerkin, you have no way of denying witches other than a complete victory. You call me Ava all of those times and seem to be under the impression that you'd be cornering me, but it's been turned over by nothing more than the inside of your respected Curiason's head. Don't you think that's truly funny? <laughs> just do it. Resign. Why don't you just accept it forever? Why don't you just lose forever? Damn it! It's impossible for a human to show. I can't do anything but guess what the dead were thinking when they acted. Furthermore, I can't deny magic just by conjecture. To break through magic, I need objective evidence as to why Kyrie-san had a change of heart. But damn it! It's been said and read that no evidence exists as to why she started wanting food. What should I do? Damn it, damn it! Battler sama may I take that? You re may I take it that you resign? I won't go to the mansion to get food, but how should I understand Kyrie-san's thoughts which actually do contradict? You can't understand. It's impossible to understand. It's impossible to interpret. That is the darkness of all... Sorry, what? I, I clicked away. Uh, that darkness is all of the witch. Come on, it's useless to think, so quit, all right? There's no way you can deny witches. I mean, look at me. I exist. I am the Golden Witch. I stole that name from that former witch over there. You can't deny that I am Beatrice. Damn it! You have no right to say that name! And yet, I can't think of a move to deny that! Battler could no longer count counter this witch who was laughing derisively in triumph. He didn't want to give up, but he could do nothing. His gr he ground his teeth, making fists with both hands. But even so, he couldn't think of a brilliant counterattack. Battler Sama, you're closing in on the time limit. Will you resign? <laughs> The human side has no move in response. We will resi- Wait! Th there is a counterattack. What? What did you just say? Huh? What kind of move could you possibly have, predecessor Sama? Care to tell me what kind of move can deny my magic? The magic of Beatrice? You can't. It's impossible. If the proposition, I won't go to the mansion get to get food, cannot be explained by itself, I will explain it with the contrapositive. In short, you may also be able to explain it with, she did go to the mansion, therefore there was a goal other than food. R rather than my specialty, Hempel's Raven, this is Battler's specialty, chessboard thinking. If it, if it is impossible for Kyrie to have gone to the mansion with food as a goal, we can only explain it with another goal, which caused Kyrie to go outside in any case. In other words, if we can establish that goal, we can defeat magic. Uh, I see. So she didn't go to the mansion with the food as goal, but had a different goal, and said that she wanted to go and get food in order to disguise her real goals. Yeah, if that's the case, it may still be possible to explain it. But how? Master, reconstruct the scene where Kyrie died. We cannot summon a ghost, but inspecting the corpse should be the human side's right. Yes, that poses no problems. I will reconstruct the scene where Shiramiya Kyrie died. We cannot call Kyrie's ghost here, but by learning what Kyrie left behind, we may be able to use that as a weapon. <laughs> Fine, search as much as you want. There's no way you'll learn anything. I just said it in red a short while ago. Kyrie did not leave anything written down. No matter what you find, how could you understand anything? We may find nothing, but Butler is grinding his teeth, fighting to think of a move to break through you. This is all I can do.
Beata landed on her feet in the reconstructed hall, approached Kyria's fallen body, and wandered around, observing. I don't quite understand the process of how the human side fights. Evidence was required, was it? Then what should I search for? The purported Great Lady Beatrice is getting down on her knees and crawling around, and she's even disgracefully searching a corpse. <laughs> now that look suits you. Say what you wish. I cannot do any more than this. I do not care how I am mocked. However, I cannot abandon Battler, as he is fighting for my honor. Even if I must crawl on the ground and search through dead flesh, I must answer to that responsibility. While being subjected to the witch's sneers, Beato searched through Kyrie's corpse. She fished through the pockets, taking out what was inside and laying it on the floor. Laid on the floor was a handkerchief, tissue, a key to her house, the stub of a plane ticket, a lighter, a cigarette butt, and a single hundred yen coin. There was no special suspicious object. Although Beata was down on all fours and being sneered at, that was all that she could find. <laughs> What's with that wretched looking trash? Come on then, how are you going to break through my magic with that stuff? Worthless, worthless, you look so dumb. What's with this state of affairs after you butted in sounding all heroic? Ah, uh, how pathetic. How embarrassing. Why don't you just give up and die forever? The witch fell over laughing, taunting Beato. Be Beato hung her head, trying to withstand this shame. Milady, are you satisfied with your inspection? Mm -hmm. I, I will not find any more than this. From this evidence, can some move be made to counter? If not, then the human side must resign. <sighs> Obviously, you don't have any room to argue back. I am a witch. You can't break through my magic. You're no longer anything but a former witch. Just a loser who isn't even allowed to take the name Beatrice anymore. Go on, pile up as much trash and rubbish as you like and try to break my magic with it. You can't, right? You can't, can you? <laughs> and why's that? It's because I'm a witch. It's because you're just a loser without a name. <laughs> something. Something should be here. I won't lose heart. I will not lose heart. No matter how much I am sneered at, Battler is fighting for my honor. So for the sake of his honor, I must not lose heart. As Beato held back tears at the words of humiliation she was being showered with, in the hope that Kyrie was holding something else, in the hope that she could find something that could save Battler from his plight, she searched earnestly. However, nothing more came up. Damn it all. Please, Ushiromiya Kyrie, I know you will save your son from his plight. Please, even after death, lend me a power for his sake. However, Kyrie's body did not answer. It was only natural that a corpse would remain silent. No dead person existed that would answer Beato, now that she had lost the endless magic. It's pointless, pointless, pointless. Toying with the dead is a privilege only for witches. For you who is neither a witch nor even a human, no one exists who will lend a hand. You will be alone for all eternity. You have no witch or human allies and no one will save you. That frustrates you. Why don't you cry forever? Why don't you apologize? Say, I'm so sorry, I'm so useless forever. <laughs> sorry, Butler. I couldn't help you in any way. No, you've done enough. Thanks, Beato. I won't waste your efforts. I don't need consoling. Just how could you argue back with this pile of rubbish? Just how could you strike back with the rubbish I endured her sneering to scrape together? In front of Beato, who was still crawling on all fours and hitting the pile of objects Kyrie had left behind with her fist, Battler also crouched. And, after patting her on the shoulder in thanks, he moved that hand to the ground, picked up the cigarette butt, and held it over his head. What are you trying to say with that trash? Curious Aunt doesn't smoke. 
but Curia was even holding a lighter. Certainly, she wasn't carrying a box of cigarettes itself, but at a glance, it very naturally looked as though Curie had a smoking habit. Dad smoked, but Curie didn't. Curie son didn't, but she did walk around with a, just a lighter to light Dad's cigarette. Huh? So what? If the husband smoked, then even if the wife didn't, it isn't strange for her to have a cigarette on her. Maybe she just picked up her husband's irresponsibly tossed cigarette butt? What are you trying to say? What does this have to do with my magic? Nothing at all. I'll say more. This is a different brand of cigarettes than Dad smokes. Sorry, Beato. Could you look in the pocket of Dad's body, too? Mm -mm. This... Checking the brand. The brand is different from the cigarette butt. The cigarette butt Kyrie had on her is not of the same brand as the cigarettes that Rudolph smokes. And so what? Maybe Kyrie is just a good girl who likes things to be clean so she couldn't leave a fallen cigarette butt alone and picked it up. I wouldn't, though. Beato, sorry, but one more time, please. Uncle Hideyoshi's pocket. In this family, only Dad and Uncle Hideyoshi smoke cigarettes. It, it's here. Is this it? Beato found a cigarette box in Hideyoshi's pocket, took a single one out, and held it out. Checking the brand. We acknowledge that the cigarette butt is of the same brand that Hideyoshi smokes. Like I said, so what? How can you break my magic because you found Hideyoshi's cigarette butt in Kyrie's pocket? That's right. This cigarette butt is our message from kyrie -san. No, this cigarette butt itself is the reason that kyrie -san left the guest house. Beato, thank you. If you hadn't found this, I would have given up here. Virgilia! Reconstruct the situation! The guest house, after it came to light that Auntie Rosa and Maria had been killed on the second twilight. Understood. Reconstructing. After Rosa and Maria's death, the remaining survivors rechecked all of the doors and windows in the mansion. They constructed a barricade. They rechecked that their defenses were solid. There's nothing suspicious about all of that. What are you trying to say? Why are you bringing back the second twilight when we're talking about the fourth twilight and after? Dad carried a portable cigarette butt holder with him. I can finally see why curious san deliberately put that cigarette butt in her own pocket. It was because that cigarette butt meant something. That very cigarette butt was the message left by curious san for us. Th let's hear it then! How are you using a single cigarette butt? Are you going to deny me? As you just heard, after the second twilight an inspection was done for all of the rooms in the guest house. At that time, Kyrie-san found something that shouldn't exist, in a place where it shouldn't be. Something that shouldn't exist? What do you mean by that? It's this. This cigarette butt. This has been set in the ashtray of the guest room where Uncle Hideyoshi had been. Huh? What's wrong with there being a cigarette butt in an ashtray? Are you sure there isn't something wrong with your head? Aunt Ava hated smoking. There's no way that there would be a cigarette butt there while she was sick and sleeping. However, there was a cigarette butt in the ashtray. When she saw that, Kyrie-san realized it immediately. Uncle Hideyoshi was lying. She realized that Aunt Eva hadn't really been sleeping, and that she had snuck out of the room. Repetition requested. This cigarette butt was stubbed out in the ashtray of a room in which Uncle Hideyoshi and Aunt Eva were resting. I... I refuse. I finally got it. Thank you, Beato. Was I... of some... Use? Yeah, you were. We'll tear it off. We'll tear the mask off that fake witch! From that cigarette butt, Kyrie realized that Hideyoshi was creating an alibi for Ava's sake. Hideyoshi had been tasked with watching over the room to create an alibi. Also, congrats to everybody in the chat who called this one. You guys really, uh, you really did it this time. And during that time, he had been unable to withstand the tension and had smoked. Then, Kyrie had disclosed that to Rudolph. She disclosed that there was a good chance that Ava was the culprit and Hideyoshi was an accomplice. Next, kyrie -san proposed that they go to get food. And then, she asked Uncle Hideyoshi to lend a hand. This can only mean one thing. kyrie -san planned to isolate Uncle Hideyoshi and question him about the truth. Hempel's Raven, valid. Unless the witch side can counterattack this move, the existence of the magic which claims to have controlled Kyrie is denied. What did you say? I deny it. Anyway, I deny it. 
It wasn't me. N no, wait. It wasn't Ushira Mia Ava. Ava was sleeping in the room. Then try saying it. You can't, and I know it. You can't say it this time either. Repetition requested. At that time, Ushira Mia Ava did not take a step outside the room. What the hell is this? I'm the one who was attacking, right? Why did I get on the side that's being attacked? When did offense and defense get reversed? I'm the one doing the questioning, you know. The witch. Me. Why? I repeat. Repetition requested. Ushirimiya Ava did not leave the room. There's no way that you can say it. It's checkmate! Does the witch side have a move in response? There cannot be one. There is no truth that can be accepted from a false witch dressed up with truths and truth, truths and falsehoods. You are qualified to call yourself a real witch. You aren't the Golden Witch. You are a human. You are a Shiramiya Ava! <laughs> the witch roared. Her entire body was burned with a tremendous heat that denied her own witchcraft and existence, and she let out a roar like a dragon. <laughs> her body flickered repeatedly, flashing as Ava's figure and the witch's figure overlapped. <laughs> However, the roar drowned out that flicker and made it return once more to the original form of the cruel-hearted witch. <laughs> All right. If you want to call me Ashira Mia Ava, then go on right ahead. I admit it. I really can't repulse all moves related to Ashira Mia Ava being the culprit. I may have been dragged down from the position of Golden Witch. And maybe I am now being called Ushiro Mia Ava. But you know what? That by itself doesn't mean that witches and magic are denied. I'll teach you now. I'll teach you that I am not Ushiro Mia Ava nor a human, but a real witch. Look and see this red truth. The witch clapped her hands, and time advanced in the world of the game board. Also, a June Pop 45 with a $10. There is no good mom or evil witch mom. Only mom. Ooh. Yeah? Uh, it, it's times like these where lines like that become extra relevant, don't they? As they called Jessica's name, Battler and Ava ran up to the parlor. They were searching for Jessica because they had gone to the servant room, found Nanjo's corpse, and didn't know where Jessica was. So what's your point? What are you trying to say? You... You couldn't be. Oh no. Beata went pale. They made it, that made it clear that the move that the evil witch was about to make was bad enough to have such an effect on Beato. This time, I'll give you a fatal move that you won't be able to talk yourself out of. No. I'll make this move against all humans who support you. Prepare yourself and listen to my move. D don't The move is... Beato, stay back. I'll take it. Bring it on, you fake witch. After Jessica was injured, Ava was constantly under Battler's supervision. Battler is neither the culprit nor an accomplice. By this, we can establish a perfect alibi for Ava. What? I'll seal you, and humans as well, in a red barrier of death that most certainly cannot be escaped from. Farewell, lowly humans. Sleep for all eternity in an absolute locked room of magic with no exits. Now, prepare yourself for the red truth. There are no more than 18 humans on this island. Throw away your foolish thoughts of mysterious people hiding and committing crimes. But if I say it this way, you could also suspect animal culprits. It would be unbearable to hear an irrational theory about how an orangutan trained to commit murder wouldn't count as a human. So I'll change it like this. 
No life forms other than humans have any connection to this game. So with that covered, next I'll explain the situation for all 18 people who exist on this island. Kinzo is dead. Kraus is dead. Datsuhi is dead. Hideyoshi is dead. George is dead. Rudolph is dead. Kiri is dead. Rosa is dead. Mar Maria is dead. Genji is dead. Shannon is dead. Kanon is dead. Goda's dead. Kumasawa's dead. Nanjo's dead. Those 15 are all dead. And Battler is alive. Ava is alive. Jessica is alive. That's everyone, all 18 of them. So you understand that accordingly when the last victim Nanjo died, only three people, Battler, Ava, and Jessica were alive, right? What? What did you say? Y you bitch! You couldn't mean... Ava was with you the whole time, so committing a crime is impossible for her. Of course, Battler Kun isn't the culprit. He wasn't forging an alibi for her, and he took the possibility that she was the culprit into account, watching over her actions carefully. No chance existed for her to do anything suspicious. In short, at the time of the crime, only Nanjo and Jessica were in the servant room. And I know what you're thinking. Your next move will be this, right? There's also a chance that Jessica's the culprit, but too bad, I'll slice it up in red before you try. Ushiramiya Jessica has not committed murder. She was not involved with Nanjo's murder. Her eyes were completely blocked. It's impossible for her to carry out a murder like that. And here's an extra. Neither Ava nor Battler killed Nanjo, nor were they involved. W wait a fucking second! That makes no goddamn sense! There are only three humans, then a murder occurs and none of those three were involved? That's insane! Or Habaki Gaming with $5. My greatest feat in Umineko is solving this one first try. The answer is so sweet and so helpful for this one. Chat, keep thinking, or be shibosteiru. Yeah, this one is very, very fucking tricky. It's, it's a really evil move. I'll state it clearly. The culprit who killed Nanja was neither Battler, nor Ava, nor Jessica. In other words, it wasn't one of, one of the survivors. Get it? N no, um... Uh, that's right. Uh, what about multiple personalities? Uh, just like you were originally another personality of Auntie Ava's, uh, let's say Jessica had another witch-like personality, uh, which took the name of someone other than Jessica and killed Dr. Nanjo. Moron. I've already said it in red. Jessica's eyes were completely blocked and murder was impossible for her. No matter what kind of personality she was possessed by, murder could not be carried out with her body. I wonder if you'll be satisfied if I say it this way. No actions caused by Jessica's body had any relation to or influence on the murder of Nanjo. This also applies to Battler and Ava. In other words, no matter how much you struggle and interpret it, neither Jessica nor Battler nor Ava is the culprit that killed Nanjo. You, you've got to be kidding me! I mean, everyone else is dead for sure, right? Then all that's left is the Dr. Nanjo suicide theory, right? And the trap theory... The culprit was already dead, but a trap that had been prepared went off. Nanjo's death was a homicide. Of course, it was with a direct method of murder, not a trap. They readied their weapon and killed him with it directly from the front at point-blank range. The culprit appeared openly before Nanjo's eyes as they both looked at each other's faces, and the culprit killed him. But wait! There are only three survivors! You said in red that everyone else is dead! You basically confirmed the life or death status of all 18 people! Furthermore, the existence of a 19th person has already been denied in Rhett. In other words, no one can exist except the three survivors. And yet a fourth person other than those three appeared before Dr. Nanjo? How can a person other than us appear and murder Dr. Nanjo when no 19th person exists? Insane! You're lying! You're lying with the red letters! The red only tells the truth. Isn't doubting that the same as betraying the honor of that witch who's behind you, shriveling up in fear of me and hiding behind your back? Damn it. I'll state it clearly, right now. The one who appeared in front of Nanja was me, a witch. The golden witch who can't be explained by the 18 humans. V Virgilia! Ronove! Isn't the situation contradicting itself? If she's really telling, is she really telling the truth with red? Yes, red truth valid. What an elaborate and precise cornering. Uh 
How should I make a move against this? Virgilia, isn't there any move? I cannot think of anything. And you, Ronove? My apologies. However, in these last thousand years, I've never seen such an elaborately beautiful game board layout. Although it pains me to admit it, it is beautiful. What a beautiful writ. Checkmate. The witch's master and the demon butler were both stunned, and a somehow rapturous expression rose to their faces. Forget surrendering. They were simply impressed at this perfect che checkmate, which could only be admired. Hold on just a second. When people accept defeat from the bottom of their heart, it gives rise to neither regret nor humiliation. Nothing is born except feelings of respect. I no longer knew what was what anymore. There, was absolutely no, there were absolutely no weak points in her red. She had said in red that all 15 people had died. She had said in red that no people existed other than the 18. In other words, no more than three people, me, Jessica, and Auntie Ava, existed. And even though none of these three people were the culprit, Dr. Nanjo was killed. And without a doubt, Dr. Nanjo's death was a homicide, murdered by that person openly from the front. And she claims that person is a witch? The culprit that killed Nanjo was not an animal or anything of the sort. That had already been dealt with in red, you know. Remove everything other than humans from consideration entirely. And no stuff like robots, either. Absolutely no factors than humans participate in this game board. Therefore, I can also say this. The one who killed Nanja was definitely a human. A human with their feet on the ground held up a weapon and killed with it, right before his eyes. However, the human may have been able to use magic, which means it was a witch. That is, in other words, me, the Golden Witch Beatrice. Even as Battler ground his teeth, his knees hit the floor with a thunk. His soul still refused to submit. However, his knees had already started to accept submission. <laughs> oh, did you kneel? That's right, you're already starting to understand. The Golden Witch does not exist, does exist, and that Golden Witch Beatrice is me. Come on, praise me. Now's the time to praise the resurrection of a true witch. Now's the time to praise the resurrection of the Golden Witch Beatrice. On the ninth twilight, the witch revives and none shall be left alive. Damn it! I don't understand! After being so thoroughly immobilized by the red, I don't have a clue anymore! B Butler, don't lose heart. You and I promised that we would fight each other again, did we not? Will you surrender here? Will you disappear in a place like this before fighting with me again? I don't want to break that promise, but... I can't think of any move to deny her! In the first place, this isn't even a proper problem! Nothing exists outside of the suspects, and all the suspects are innocent! I've been told that they were innocent and red, and also that this was a real homicide and that the culprit was human, and they did appear in front of Dr. Nanjo's eyes and kill him! I give up! There's nothing I can do! Please, Butler, don't give up! Don't lose heart! If you stop thinking, it automatically becomes your loss! I'm begging you, don't lose heart! I'm also cheering you on, so don't lose! I can't think of anything anymore. I end up thinking that she's just a witch anyway and must have done it with magic. So just thinking is pointless. It's no good. My head hurts. My brain's tired. I end up thinking that thinking's pointless, so I should just stop! Butler, listen. In this game of chess, both sides do all they can to make the other lose, so a single game takes a long period of time. However, if one side throws away victory from the beginning and voluntarily makes moves harmful to themselves, the game will end in the blink of an eye. That is called a fool's mate. 
A fool's mate is simply put, a strange way of playing chess, with the mind to lose as soon as possible. Opening the area in front of your own king and inviting the opponent's queen in. Chess, in which the average playing time for a single game may stretch for several hours, can be resolved in a scant four moves. In other words, if both sides try to win in a fight, they're compelled to take a painfully long period of time. But if one side decides to lose, they can end the game all too easily at any time. When the human side stops thinking, it hands the problem before its eyes over to the witch. And even an apple falling from a tree can be immediately resolved as the work of magic. And it is the same way for the witch side. Witches use the red truth. If they use that to show the true form of magic can be explained away using humans, they can immediately lose. You don't have to tell me that. You're telling me to stop, not to stop thinking, right? But how am I meant to counterattack her perfect bright red move? For me, for humans, it's no longer possible. Is it impossible? Is it impossible for you, Battler? Please. Don't lose heart. Sorry. It's no longer possible for me. Battler scratched at the floor, crying heavily. Beata watched that with a distressed face. Then she stood up and spoke to the witch. I will make a move as a counterattack to yours. Huh? How can you possibly cut up this perfect checkmate? How can this checkmate, which is a completely impossible for humans to break, possibly be broken by the likes of you? Beatrice, you couldn't be. Mm. What about a move that a human cannot make? I will counterattack you with a move that I can use because I am a witch. A move that you can use because you're a witch? What? What are you planning to do? I will use the red to deny witches. B Beatrice! M lady. The master and the butler were both startled. I also immediately understood what it meant. To use the red that only witches could use. To use the red to deny witches. It was like using her own sword to slit her own throat. What? What? Come on, what are you saying? Deny witches with red! D don't talk like an idiot! If you do that, you won't get away unscathed either! You are not a witch. And I am not a witch either. The road to becoming a true witch is difficult. And I have much, much farther to go. Then that is convenient. In this place now, witches did not exist from the beginning. I will strip this deception away myself. You and I are both real, obvious witches! Being able to use red is itself proof that we are! I don't know what the definition of a witch is to you, but if you're mistakenly thinking that you alone will be able to get away unscathed, then you'd better... I am making no such mistake. I would accept it. What, what did you say? I never managed to become a witch in the first place. I've done nothing more than finally begin walking on the road to becoming a true witch. If it is true that I am a witch as I stand, then I am nothing more than a false witch who got addicted to power like you. Rather than existing in any shabby f in that shabby form, I would have no regrets in erasing this form of mine along with you. Uh, are you insane? Stop it! I still want to be a witch! I don't want to be a human! Witch, please return to your seat. Please receive the human side's response from your seat. What are you doing? Let go of me! Don't let that woman use red! Make her stop! Let go! As the witch stood from her seat and tried to spring upon Beato, Ronave pressed down on both of her shoulders, forcing her back into her seat. And even after that, he didn't remove his hands from those shoulders. Denying witches was the same thing as denying magic. That included demons such as Ronave. However, instead of running away, Ronove chose to act as the facilitator for the game, and to carry out that duty for his master's sake. Beatrice, you have no regrets, I hope. The same to you. Sorry. Even though you taught me a lot of fun magic and happy spells, I couldn't use it well at all. So I'll train from zero, 
and start over again. That you had to get caught up in your stupid disciples' misconduct. I had a good disciple in the very end. Go and do as you believe. I, I don't have a clue what you guys are talking about, but I do understand one thing. And I can say this, Beato, I don't know what you're trying to do, but whatever it is you're about to do, don't do it! You have no moves, but I have one. If we let this move escape us, she will be revived as a witch in the true sense. And this time, she will control this whole island. All nightmares will be hers to do with as she pleases. And this night island will fall into the deepest hell of the evil witch's constant fantasies for all of eternity. Can you permit that? Is it all right for your dear relatives to be toyed with for all eternity in that witch's nightmare? Still, you shouldn't have to sacrifice yourself! This is a game between me and her! There's no need for you to sacrifice yourself to make a move! I'll think of something! I'll definitely think of a miracle move! So don't rush into it! Uh, damn it all the hell! I'll definitely think of one, so don't rush into it! This game is cruel. The time limit for your deliberation has already run out. I am now the only one who can do it. Worry not, Battler. I will defeat her. I'll defeat the cruel-hearted witch with my own hands. Wait! Beato! Stop it! Quit it! There's absolutely no need for you to sacrifice yourself! Must I remember you were fighting to deny me? What a strange person. <laughs> Let that child do as she likes. And please, see her through. But... Butler, there's only one thing I ask. Would you cover your ears? Your ears? Why? In a few moments, I will deny witches in red. I will slice up the game board that she has laid out with her red. By doing that, I will probably lose my form as a witch as well. If you also hear the red truth I will tell, you will understand my true form. Even if you alone cover your ears, the truth will not change at all. However, even so, I want you alone to cover your ears. I at least want to be a witch in your eyes. Please. Beatrice, Emma. There is no problem on the witch side. Please, your move. Let go! You won't get away unharmed either, you know! She's insane! She plans on dying and taking us with her! Stop it! Don't deny it! Stop! How unsightly for a golden witch. Now, are you ready? I will remove your checkmate in Battler's stead. What happened on the chessboard where fifteen died and only three remained? I will now expose it with red. With that red truth, I will impale and kill both faith witches. Beato turned around and smiled at Battler. Most likely, no one would believe that the witch who had gone to the limits of cruelty would try to leave a smile as the last expression she showed Battler. And that smile signified her last wish, that she wanted him to cover his ears. Denying witches in red was the same as knowing her shabby form. Battler put both of his hands against his ears, to protect her final honor as a witch, he put his hands against his ears, rejecting the truth. And he howled so that not even a bit of what she was saying would slip into his ears. After that was a world where Battler could not hear anything. Beata was saying something with Red. Even the evil witch attempted to cover her ears as their, at their bitter contents. That was the Red Truth. Words of power. Words that denied her own existence. Words that only witches could use. The only words capable of denying witches. Beata talked. With the red truth, she sliced apart the bright red game board that the witch had released. She explained difficult problems that could not be solved by humans, with moves that could only be solved by witches and began cornering the witch, the truth that Battler was not permitted to hear. If Battler had spoke, broken his promise and sneakily listened in, in an instant, Battler would probably have been able to become the victor in his game with Beato. He would probably have understood all the riddles on the island, all of the magic and tricks, locked rooms, spells, curses, legends, and the entire tale of anger and sadness. However, Battler would only learn what that was when he reached the truth by himself. 
Yes. From the beginning, Beatrice had wished that Balor would reach that truth by himself. It was something that shouldn't be reached by being told. It was a truth that Battler would have to drag himself to with his own power. A brilliant light gathered with Beato and the evil witch at the center, and grew gradually stronger. It was the power of truth. A heat and brilliance like the sun shone on all of the falsehoods that hid in the darkness, trying to deceive and burnt them to nothing. of gold, even with magic to split the sea. There are some things that you can never obtain. Come, show yourself! Show your true form! Hashira Eva! When the sun exploded and blew everything away, Eva could be seen there, holding a gun. Oh, Tava! <laughs> Took you long enough to notice, Butler Kun. Without any hesitation or mercy, Ava raised the gun and pulled the trigger. An explosion resounded, and Battler fell to the floor, his heart shot through. After going into convulsions for a short time, with blood dripping from his mouth, Battler died. Ushirimiya Battler, shot and killed by Ushirimiya Eva inside the mansion. The murder weapon was a sawed-off rifle from Kinzo's collection. Jessica lost her eyesight. There was only her and Battler. Wolves and sheep puzzle. But in his last moments, he understood without a doubt that she was the murderer, and not just for killing him. There were several murders where I don't have a clue how they were carried out. However, while my ears were covered, Beato exposed all of them with the red, blasting away all magic. In other words, even though I didn't understand it, hadn't that been nothing more or less than proof that all magic can be explained with humans? Beato made me cover my ears, so I myself don't know the whole truth. However, from the fact that she managed to deny it in red, I learned one fact was extreme, which is extremely unfair for us. Namely, it is possible to deny all magic. So in other words... No. I must not think of that. If I do, then the time I covered my ears would be made pointless. If I'm going to regret, I can only regret my own actions. If at that time I had thought of some turnabout move to counter the witch's final play, there would have been no need for Beato to sacrifice herself. I brought about this conclusion because I was worthless. Even though it was a pitch black world where nothing could be seen, for some reason I felt Beato's presence right next to me. So I tried calling out to her. You can exchange words with someone whether they're a human or a witch. So even in a world where witches have been denied, I should be allowed to talk to her. Beato. Battler is it. It is done. I did it. Yeah. I didn't hear it. But I watched you. Until the very end. I was watching as you boldly stood up to that evil witch. With this... I'm no longer a witch, but I will definitely become a witch again, and I will make it so that I can be called the Golden Witch again, and then, when I am ready to be accepted as your opponent, I will return once more. No, you were a witch. <laughs> I was watching when you took that evil witch and blew her away with that awesome magic. Exposing her true form. I was watching with my own eyes. Th that wasn't magic. 
But the red, no, it was magic. You were definitely the golden witch. Even if you deny it yourself, I'll accept it. You are definitely the golden witch. When Battler said those words, in the world that had been dark, there was suddenly a single grain. A small grain of gold, like a wheat seed, shone brightly. Even though it was small, it had a strong gold-colored glow. And it illuminated the two of them, sitting with their backs together, so that they became aware of their own form. They did not exist only as consciousness. They became aware that they had bodies, and definitely existed. No, maybe we should say that they had each been given an existence called a body. When Battler looked at his own form, he wasn't that surprised. But when Beato looked at her own form, she was a little startled. From Battler's perspective, she looked just like normal. But for a short while, she was surprised by that form. What is going on? The glow from that grain of light is getting stronger and stronger. That grain of wheat was no longer simply gold-colored, but was like the light of the sun. Then, it softly began to approach Beato's chest. When that grain of the sun was sucked inside her chest, the world became wrapped in a deep blue sky, and then a deep blue ocean spread out beneath them. An island rose up, trees sprouted and created a forest. Walls surrounded us and a ceiling swallowed us. And it became adorned with more and more things until we realized that this was the hall in the Ushirimiya mansion. In that fantastical hall where many gold butterflies beat their wings, many tables were set up with white tablecloths like it was a party and beautiful cooking and fruits were set out. And over there were a great many figures Everyone was there, talking together and smiling. Guys. <laughs> there was Dad and curious on Uncle Kraus on Natsuhi and Auntie Rosa, and of course, even Auntie Eva and Uncle Hideyoshi. George Aniki, Jessica, Maria. Wait, wait, even Shannon-chan, Kanon-kun, Goda-san, and Kumasawa-san are here. Everyone, everyone was at the party, clapping their hands and celebrating our return. Why? Everyone was dead! Why are they alive? In the Golden Land, all the dead people's souls can be revived. Welcome back, Beatrice. And welcome, Batlakun. Welcome to the Golden Land. I... I made it? I made it! To the door of the Golden Land! Yes. Milady, you've finally been able to invite everyone to the Golden Land. Welcome, Batlasama, to the Golden Land. Battler. So, you finally made it this far. G grandfather Where in the world am I? My blood, which is incompatible with magic, runs more deeply in your veins than any other. Therefore, you were the only one who could not reach the Golden Land, and Beatrice has been searching for you ever since. She tried everything to bring you here. What, what did you say? It seems that we're all here at last. Battler-sama, if you would please take your seat. Tonight's dinner is my very best work. If you would please relish it. You should be honored. Normally I would have eaten all of it, but I left you guys some out of pity. <laughs> the seven steak, babes. In the Golden Land, all of those with minds are equal. Here, there's no distinction between us furniture, humans, or witches. Butler Summer, we were waiting for you. And welcome to the Golden Land. Shannon John! Georgiani Key! <laughs> I'm still suspecting that this might be a dream. I'm sure that we died, but we're alive. And everyone, every one of us is here. And we're all happy. I can't believe it. That's right. This place must be a dream world. So it doesn't matter that George is so friendly with the maid girl. It has to be a dream! <laughs> 
Give it a rest, Ava. For now, you gotta stay quiet and bless the two youngins. The Golden Land's a capital of bliss. We should never quarrel here. Here, any people are free to love each other. No one needs to hesitate over it. Jessica-chan, Kanon-kun, so wonderful. I'm so jealous. Uh, hey, Butler. This is kind of, um... <laughs> Butler-sama, welcome. And welcome home. Jessica was probably embarrassed because she was holding hands with Kanon-kun. And Kanon-kun wanted to act humbly like a servant and bow. But since neither of them could let go of the other's hand, he couldn't do it so well, and the whole scene looked fairly comical. With a servant child! I forbid it! I couldn't possibly give away our Jessica to such a person! Why not allow it? Let us at least hear the- let her at least choose the person she liked. I forbid it! I forbid it! Ah, oh, Jessica! Mine has got a right too! Oh, George! As Aunt Natsui and Auntie Eva hugged each other, they cried tears of regret for their darling children. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, Care Baron Ross with the five dollars. It's so cool that this absolutely, definitely only three part VN ends on, ends on such a happy note. <laughs> True. Even though they had always been at odds, it was a very bizarre scene. It really isn't a problem, right? It doesn't matter who likes who. Exactly. It's proof that the parent hasn't let go of their child. Butler, you can bring home whatever kind of woman you want. I'll accept her warmly, all right? You can't introduce her to this guy, you know. He'll get his hands on her immediately. He'll elope right away. Butler, you finally came here. <laughs> Maria, from the beginning, you knew that we would be coming here? Hmm, that's why I wasn't scared at all. Everyone was a fraidy cat. It was funny. What the hell? Even though I thought you were the most screwed up, you actually knew the truth from the beginning. H how rude. It's absolutely unforgivable to speak of Lady Maria in that way. Forming fire and curve attack preparations ready. Lady Maria, we can attack at any time. <laughs> Ouch! Quiet. You're in the presence of Beatrice, Sama. Well, there's no need to be quite so strict. For now, let us take their desire to fool around and play together in cons into consideration. More importantly, why don't we begin preparing for the toast? Yes, I've finished preparing my excellent mackerel cooking. I can serve it at any time. Hey, ladies! Work a little more like furniture! No! I want to stuff myself some more! <laughs> Come on, let's work. Don't keep the guests waiting. Let's work studiously and attend to them. Don't let the guests do anything. Make them lazy. Make them slothful. Fatten them like pigs. <laughs> Beatrice. Batlacu. This way. Grandfather and Virgilia were standing on the landing at the top of the staircase, beckoning us. Beato and I looked at each other quizzically, then climbed the stairs together. From the hall, it looked like a very high stage. A small table had been set up there, as well as a piece of parchment and an old-fashioned quill pen. I saw that strange magical characters in Japanese were written side by side, and below it many names were written. There were seventeen of them. Grandfather was the first, and everyone else's names had been signed below in one long column. The people who arrived at the Golden Land probably signed this one after another. Butler, now that you're here, everyone is gathered. Listen carefully. The Golden Land is not a world supported by the power of magic alone. The cooperation and approval of all humans who receive happiness here is required. For that sake, we must gather the signatures of everyone here. Last time, the door to the Golden Land was finally opened, but you refused to sign. Although you probably don't remember it. Because you refused to sign, this world was once again sealed into darkness. Just hearing it like that, kinda sounds like I've been the only stubborn one. And I've been causing everyone all kinds of trouble. That's because you're a certified hardhead. It seems that you inherited more than just blood from Kinzo. Beata laughed amiably. I knew I was being made fun of, but that smile led me to go along with her, and I laughed without thinking. Magic is a miracle. Miracles cannot be completed unless everyone believes. And when you do, as the last to do so, this miracle, the Golden Land, will be completed. Uh, looks like I've been a real pain. So, what should I do? First, sign here. 
Then, Beatrice, sign here. It's hard to use a quill pen. Whoa, it's shot! You klutz. Shooting ink is a bad omen. Can't you at least write your name quickly? In, in that illegible scrawl. <laughs> what about you? Don't write it in cap- Don't write it in katakana like that. Beatrice is a stylish name, so write it in cursive. You're making the quill and your name cry. Shut up! In school, they did they not tell you not to use cursive on tests? This is a solemn ceremony. Be silent. Very good. We've gathered the two signatures, as well as the form for the covenant. Both of you, your oath, please. We'll start with Beatrice. Put your hand on the covenant and take the oath. I, Beatrice, as a good witch, swear to continue with my training for the sake of bringing happiness to the people. Say it. Mm -mm. It's a little embarrassing. I, Beatrice, as a good witch, swear to continue with my training for the sake of bringing happiness to the people. Is that all right? Good. Butler is next. In the same way, Butler Kun, put your hand on the covenant and take the oath. I, Ushirimiya Butler, as a member of the Golden Land, swear to serve for the sake of bringing happiness to myself and my neighbor. Ah, I, Ushirimiya Butler. As a member of the Golden Land, swear to serve for the sake of bringing happiness to, to myself and my neighbor. I'm embarrassed too. Hear me, one and all. Here and now we have gathered the oaths of all 18 humans, excepting the Golden Land. When Kinzo proclaimed that, everyone applauded at once, praising us. Since I had been the only stubborn one and had just been a nuisance, I felt a little bad about being the most celebrated one. And with that, in accordance with the ancient rites, we ask Batlerkun the last to make the oath to sign the invitation to the Golden Land. This is something that invites the Golden Witch Beatrice to the Golden Land. The Golden Land invites the Golden Witch through a consensus of those who have accepted it and becomes complete. Butler, I will read it out loud. Listen carefully. The eighteen of us acknowledge the Golden Witch to be Beatrice and welcome her to the Golden Land. What's going on with you? She won't be invited unless I send an invitation? Seems that's the ceremony. It makes me uncomfortable also. Why don't we end it quickly? Yeah, I've been so hungry for a while now. Come to think of it, I've only been pecking at canned food and haven't eaten anything good. Let's get this thing signed and be done with it. Let's see here. We accept you as a witch. Huh? That's pretty simple. Damn you grandfather exaggerating how it actually says it. Come on, come on, quickly. Sign. Right here. Huh? Quickly. Sign. With slightly weird and uncomfortable smiles, the two of them started demanding that I sign. Oh, fuck yeah, here she is! Don't say it yet. Chat, don't say it yet. At that time, an incredible sound like that of a glass window breaking reverberated through the hall. And the bustling tumult melted back into complete silence. I dropped the quill pin and turned around, trying to see what had happened. Chat, do not say the name. If anybody knows the name, do not say it. It's going to be revealed in a bit. Don't say it yet. I dropped the quill pin and turned around, trying to see what had happened. When I did, where had she come from? A human who clearly hadn't been there a short while ago was in the very center of the hall, looking up at us. Who is that? A woman? She's probably about the same age as Jessica and me. Caravan Ross, two dollars. Repetition requested. Bad bitch enters the scene. <laughs> uh, request accepted. But I didn't know that face. None of the other people here knew that face either. But who are you? Who is this? Where did you come from? Those without invitations are not needed at my party. Servants, throw her out! As you command, surround her! The Seven Sisters of Purgatory surrounded her from seven directions, taking out magic blades that drew purple trails and blocking her. And from out of nowhere, shuffling goat-head servants appeared in great numbers surrounding that woman. 
On top of that, the Chiester sisters stood in front of Beato like a wall, readying a golden bow and pulling back the bowstring. But the woman didn't move at all. On the contrary, she was still staring at us on the landing, not paying them the slightest bit of attention. Who was she looking at? Beato? Grandfather? It couldn't be. Me? Yes. The woman was staring straight into my eyes, glaring. Then, after our eyes met perfectly, she yelled. You must not sign that! Are you going to accept your own defeat? Don't be tricked by the witch! Huh? By the witch? Huh? Just then, something incredible, incredibly strong lifted me by the nape of my neck. What's going on? And after I was forced to turn around, I saw Virgilia with an eerie smile on her face and the muscular forms of goat monsters. A goat monster that looked like it was two meters tall was holding me up with an arm as thick as a log. <laughs> There's no need to listen to an uninvited guest. Come, give your signature as well. On this written oath, assure me a battler accepts the existence of witches. Come now, sign the written oath! Ow! 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 Damn it, let go! As the goat monsters constricted me with the power of a vice, they forced me to grab the quill pin. I couldn't even touch the floor with my feet, much less resist. Vattler, why are you resisting? Weren't you just about to sign willingly? Don't change your mind now after all that, all right? Didn't you think for an instant that it might be all right to accept witches? You thought that, right? <laughs> I was tricked? That can't be. You aren't that kind of... I am that kind of person! Uh, it's no good. I can't keep this up. It looks like sentimental sob stories don't match well with me. Master, with all of your strength, if you please. That was such a plain role to play, and I got so bored. I don't know who you are, woman, but I'll beat you to death, mash you and crush you until threads start trailing. Got it? I'll make you regret being born a woman! <laughs> Beato raised her gold pipe high, and the massive chandelier hanging in the hall crackled with electricity, and from that fell an almighty purple thunderbolt. It was a direct hit on the woman right below it, and should have turned her to ash. However, not a single hair was singed. Oh, I see you have what it takes to show up uninvited. Tell me, say your name. I don't have any name to tell you. More importantly, you idiot! How long are you going to be tricked? Stop being so naive and trusting! Figure it out already! All of this, all of this is the witch's trap! Those words were aimed at me. This is all. The witch's trap, she says. That can't be. Beato reformed and swore to become a good witch. Beato, calling it a trap is a lie, right? Please, tell me it's a lie. Sorry, Butler. It was pretty interesting. Still, I was just trying to do what Master told me, but it really did work out very well. I hear, after acting bad-tempered and exploring the depths of cruelty, if you act properly incompetent and soft, you can get a massive rise on that goodwill meter thing, right? I've heard that villains that go soft and then crazy are pretty popular these days. Despite how I look, I've studied a lot of manga, anime, and galgay that have been possible and popular recently, you see. And I tried it, tried it out, and just as expected, it was, Tears, please, and you're down. <laughs> Idiot! What a truly simple person. They call this the North Wind and the Sun strategy. <laughs> oh, could... D damn you, you two-faced bitch! How dare you deceive me like this! Yes, that expression fits you the most. That caring expression of yours really doesn't match me after all. 
My back was itching and I was frantically trying to withstand it. <laughs> Too bad! Witches don't reform! <laughs> you take care of the signature, master. This uninvited guest is my prey. Come, you can no longer refuse to sign. Now come on. Sign it and offer your body, your mind, and your soul. When Virgilia lifted her chin as a signal, the goat monsters with even more vice-like power forced my arm to approach the parchment. Ow, ow, ow. These guys are trying to make me sign even if it breaks my arm. At that moment, a bright red light burst open with me at the center, knocking the witches and the goat monsters away. Did that woman save me? But who in the world is that? I don't have a clue. How long do you plan to keep playing in a place like this? Enough already! I'm jealous of you. Uh, I'm glad that you saved me, but that's a pretty cruel way to say it. Sorry, but who are you? Witch of Rukenjima! It's time you gave him back! <laughs> who would do that, you fool? Butler is my toy. My favorite toy, the best toy in the world! I won't get tired of him. I won't throw him away. I won't hand him over to anyone. Even Battler is enjoying this to the fullest. Together with me, he's having so much fun playing. No matter who you are, I won't let you intervene. Oh yeah, it really does look like you're living it up here. I'm so jealous my blood is boiling. In a wonderful place like this, guffawing and having a lively, fun, noisy blast of a time with everyone. Surrounded by lots of eye candy witches and being pampered all the time. I'm sure you're having so much fun you don't even want to come back! Uh, are you talking to me? Uh, wait, wait, you got the wrong idea. Uh, this is a pain for me too. The hell is fun about this? You don't know a damn thing about my troubles. What troubles? You get to have fun living with mom and dad! You get to play around happily with all of the cousins! You get to play with pleasant witches as long as you want for eternity! Don't you realize the happiness that you have? I'm jealous of all of you, don't you get it? I'd love to be a part of all of this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but no. I'm satisfied with the toys I have. A to rude toy like you is not fitting for my toy box. Yes, I'm aware of that. Who would ever play with someone like you? But I will thank you a bit for bringing everyone together like this. Who are you? You can't be. I see. So that's it. Yes, I get it. I know who you are. I see. So you are the piece Lady Burncastell threw in. I like it! Why don't I formally invite you to my party? I'll welcome you fully. Along with Battler, I'll play with you nicely, break you, kill you, crush you, turn you to ash, mix you with bread dough, and bake you until you're fluffy. <laughs> <sighs> That's no good. No good at all. You'll never be able to do that. Rukenjima, in the year 1986, I will expose everything that happened then to the light of day. I'll teach you that no more than Needle Ice, scared of the Spring of Truth, that you're no more than Needle Ice, yeah. Prepare yourself, Golden Witch! Beatrice! But we still have the tea parties after this too. So we're not quite done yet. <laughs> Hey guys, what did you think about the finale of episode 3 so far, though? Uh, what's, what's running through your head right now? <laughs> oh yeah, you guys are going through it, aren't ya? I had, to, I had to put everything I had into this part because there are so many good scenes that I wanted to act out very well. Um, I do want to point out, somebody said this earlier in the chat, and I do agree with it, especially based on her like little flash frame faces. But uh, I do think that like 
Beato is in some ways reassuming a villain position. Like she did actually seem to me like she, some of all, what she did was very genuine. Uh, I just think that, you know, she's kind of in this, a, at this point now where it's like a sunk cost sort of thing where it's like, well, uh, I'm the villain of the game. So here I am to be the villain again. <clears throat> um, what did you guys think about Virgilia, though? Because Virgilia having that hill face turn made me, like, go fucking insane when I first saw it. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? She's- <laughs> what? She's been like this the whole time! <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that's really Virgilia. Okay, interesting. I can't believe my god mom you lied to me. <laughs> um, somebody asking why would uh, Beato fumble the bag? Um, maybe maybe you should wait until the uh, maybe you should wait until the tea party to find out. Uh, the winner is the new golden witch Ava Beatrice because she solved the riddle of the golden time. The seventeen all died. When the seagulls cried, just one person was, ale was left alive. Oh hey, that's different. I wonder what that's about. I wonder if we're gonna find anything out about that. Iconic laser with the five dollars to surviving Rokenjima. Something to grow on. Uh, it's 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 real hard, but maybe somebody has finally done it. I'm sure that's fine. <laughs> All right, chat. It's tea party time. Are you ready? Let's fucking go. And yeah, Battler died rather than being missing. That's true. <laughs> I never thought that Lady Berncastell's piece would barge in at the very end. I searched all over the place for a piece fitting for a game with you. I'm sure that you'll grow to enjoy her. What's with that piece? Who was that person? Who was it? She didn't say your name. That's not fair. Hey, don't you think so too? I have a general idea. Come on. Normally anyone would know. Normally? No, we wouldn't. It was that character's first appearance, wasn't it? If she doesn't say her name, I won't- uh, the players won't- everyone won't know, right? Beato, it's all right if you don't tell her. See? Isn't she a funny kid? <laughs> mm. Lady Lambda Delta's simple-minded simple naivete truly is precious and funny. <laughs> why, why, why am I the only one you won't tell, you meanie? Okay, in exchange, I'll teach you a special secret that only I know. So tell me. Oh? A special secret, you say? Now that, now that I do want to hear. Bleh. If you want me to tell you first, first you have to tell me who that woman really was. The secret I know sure is awesome. I mean, it's gonna like blow you away like finding out that Santa sounds actually daddy. Huh? <laughs> Oopsie, sorry. I bet you're so shocked that your world's turned upside down, right? <laughs> <sighs> your father was the one who came to your place, Lambda. To my place? Wait, what's that supposed to mean? Lord Santa Claus only visits the homes of children with clean hearts. He didn't come to your place, then? Well, Lord Santa Claus is gracious. Unless you're a really bad scoundrel, he'll give you a present. After all, he even gave them to me. As you go and your heart becomes hardened, he stops coming, doesn't he? How old were you, Beata, when he stopped coming? Hmm... He stopped coming when I was about... 12? My, ma ma my maiden's heart awoke, and I quickly got somewhat embarrassed about Lord Santa coming. After I wrote, thanks for everything, that's enough, so make sure you splurge on the last presents. He stopped coming. Oh, and I was looking forward to it, too. How old were you when he stopped coming, Lady Burncastell? I was pretty wild. 
It happened fairly, fairly early. I think when I was about nine. Something about that beard really irritated me. So I waited in my futon with some sewing scissors ready, thinking I'd cut it off. What a cringeworthy age. So, Lady Lambda Delta, as long as you can remember, Lord Santa Claus has never come to see you, you say. He usually comes until the last year of elementary school or during elementary, or during middle school. Maybe we should have a doctor look at her. I hear that maturing too fast can have an adverse effect on the growth of mind and body. Yeah, there's definitely some of those. Adverse effects. Hey, what are you guys talking about? Ah! <laughs> it truly is boisterous when three witches gather. If you're talking about that level of secret, I doubt it's worth listening to. Can I go now? I have to prepare for the next game. What? Hey, wait a sec! Tell me who that woman really was! Well then, tell this special secret of yours first. If it's good enough, then I'll tell you. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you. And it really is a special secret, okay? Remember in this game, there was a girl who found the gold and became the new witch, right? Hmm. Just what kind of secret could that person have? <laughs> I realized who that girl actually is. Does anyone know? <laughs> there was a hint in the way that she talked. Remember, that girl said it a lot, right? Why don't you do something forever, right? Yes, that fra phrase was the main point. Forever? Forever? Yes. She was actually Shirmia Ava. What do you think? Are you shocked? <laughs> oh, I did notice that. Hmm, to think that there would be a hint in a place like that. You're too good at playing along with her, Banto. This kid can get a little full of herself, so don't take it too far. See ya, I'm leaving. But wait, wait! It's not fair you just listen to my secret and don't tell me yours! Tell me who she really was! Your secret was so incredible that mine just wouldn't match up. So in exchange, I'll tell you my own special secret. I'll tell you the name of the culprit in this game called Higurashi no Nakakoroni. Ah! Don't tell me! I'm playing it right now! <laughs> See you, Beato. The black tea was delicious. Oh, and about the crackers, though, the repertoire of jam was lacking. Get some go- Goshi- go Goshi- I don't know. Chili paste every once in a while. It goes great with Russian tea. Or how about gave me with the $5? In terms of when they cry lore, the exchange about Santa is so hilarious to me, but nobody talks about it. Might be my favorite tea party pre-answers for jokes. Same, I love this bit. Uh, there's an illustration in the manga where you actually see, like, Burn, quote unquote, uh, in her little like futon, like huddled under the blanket, holding like a knife. <laughs> it's while Santa walks into the room, or scissors rather, while Santa walks into the room. It's really funny. <laughs> Later. I see. All right. I shall try it. I shall call for you when the preparations are finished for the next game. Until then, feel free to draw up a strategy a strategy at your leisure. Yes, I will. This last game was pretty interesting. Later. Hey, wait a sec! Tell me! <laughs> my, my. You two really are close. <laughs> yes, that's right. Oh, how I love you, Vern Castell. You could even say that I'm in love with you. I want to gouge out her eyes so she can see no one other than me. Oh, wouldn't that just be to die for? It'd be wonderful to dunk them in black tea. <laughs> Who knew that she had entranced Lady Lambda Delta to this extent? It seems I carry a heavy responsibility. Still, this last game truly was close. I was a breath away from defeating Battler. Beato, can I ask you something? What is it? I won't tell you that girl's name. <laughs> Just when are you going to stop screwing around? Do you even have the slightest intention of winning? Lambda Delta threatened her with a low voice that she had never used in front of Burncastel. It completely blew away the calm atmosphere which had been there until a moment ago. You know, I'm supporting you because that you're because you're meant to be a witch who can win against Burncastel. If you don't have the power to win against her, then I'm ready to abandon you at any time. Got it? Escaping. What about me dissatisfies you? As you know, my game board is perfect. 
Lady Burncastell will never be able to win. Yeah, that's right. Your board truly is impressive. Burncastell could spend a hundred years, or even a thousand years here, and she would still be unable to win against this game board. It truly is that impressive and perfect. That's why, in exchange for letting me borrow that, I made you a witch. If I stop being your guardian, you'll immediately going ba go back to being a human. Make sure you don't forget that. No matter how much more incredible magical power you hold, you are nothing more than a temporary witch. Uh, I knew that. Uh, I'm grateful to you. Don't speak so casually. I'll forget that when Bernka spells around. I won't when she isn't. Recently, maybe you've forgotten your debt to me. That is uh, not so, my lady. Uh, change my mind. That creeps me out. You can talk the same way as usual, but be mindful of what you say. I have a surprisingly short temper, you see. Back to the point. Your game board truly is perfect. You should be able to defeat Burncastell without any trouble. But this kid won't give in easily. She'll challenge you over and over. That's no problem. It's been certified by you, Lady Lambda Delta. My game board is perfect. Yeah, that's right, it's perfect. So long as you, the player, are perfect as well, that is. Uh, I don't understand what you mean by this. What I mean by this? That's what I want to ask you. You play around a lot in your games. At first I thought it was part of your tactics, because it would completely baffle Burncastell from time to time. But I get the feeling that that's not quite true. You're not playing around in a match that you know you can win. The truth is, you don't care whether you win or lose, do you? Ridiculous. How could that be? Listen close, okay? Your role is to break Burncastell, force her to yield. In other words, that means being the victor in this game for all eternity. As long as you keep trying to become the certain victor, then I will grant you my power as the Witch of Certainty. However, if you fight in a way that doesn't deny any possibility of your loss, that's a different story. This is a game, of course. In the same way that Lady Burncastell will lose if I win, there will be some days on which I lose and she will win. <laughs> the possibility of loss always exists. That's why I... This is why you're useless. There's no need for this to be a game board for you. It either it simply needs to be a birdcage to lock Burncastell up here for all eternity. What's the role of a birdcage? Making certain that the little bird inside never escapes. What's a birdcage worth if it has gaps that sometimes lets the bird out? Of course. Games exist to be won. So it is impossible for me to lose. Therefore, I will continue to win. As you wish, for all eternity. Good answer. That's all I want. I'll allow you to play around and use fakes as part of your tactics. It was sometimes effective in this last game. But hear this. If you make a move hoping for anything else other than victory, make sure you're wonderfully prepared. Okay? Uh, I will do no such thing. I swear it. Originally, you weren't even a witch. And I can remind you what a truly shabby creature you were at any time. If you betray my expectations... At that time, I will have a delightful, delightful penalty waiting for you. Of the billions of fragment worlds out there, I'll send you into the most miserable fragment and seal you there. You were miserable in the first place, so it'll be worth choosing a really miserable fragment. <laughs> How I love you, Burncastell. Scrabble your feet and Beatrice's birdcage as much as you like, and spend a thousand years learning that you can no longer escape. And when you give in, I'll train you so that you can't tweet in anyone's palm but mine. <laughs> We're not done yet. We have the secret tea party left, too. So, everybody, you ready to wrap up episode three once and for all? Whether you're ready or not, it comes all the same. Let's go.
12 years later. October 4th, 1998. A monotonous electronic sound kept on repeating. The theme of that room was a so-called hygienic emotionless white. It was a room of a certain university hospital. An ordinary person wouldn't be able to afford the cost of even a single night in this room. A room which neither her doctors nor she herself had any doubts would be the last she ever stayed in. Was the person on the bed, Ava. She looked haggard and aged, to the point that you would not believe it was her unless you were told. A well-built man in a suit, waiting in the corner near the door, was having a conversation with the outside in a low voice over the intercom. He was a guard protecting Ava's person. After telling the person on the other end of the intercom to wait, he approached Ava's bed. Ava had been awake for a while. However, she stared at a single point in empty space, as though her mind was not in the same place. Anjis, Okay. Anjisan has arrived in the lobby below. Should we let her pass? By the way, I, I do know, like, from listening to the Japanese, obviously, it's it's more closely, like, pronounced, like, Anje, Anje, kind of, but, like, for some reason, I've always just said Anje, and it's too late for me to change it now, so there you go. For a long time, Ava didn't answer. However, bit by bit, her eyes began to regain their focus, and she gave a small nod, indicating that she didn't mind if they called Anje. Ava herself had been the one to call her, and she was right on time. Ava now refused to meet with anyone without an appointment made in advance. The reason the room was dark, even though it was still light outside, was because the curtains were closed. There was always one guard waiting in the room, and three more waiting in the corridor in the lobby. They were all there to protect Ava's person. Eventually, there was the sound of a knock. Also, there was a message from the intercom that the guest's body check had been completed with no problems. The door was unlocked, then opened, and a woman of about high school age was standing there. German. Andresan is arrived. Ava reacted and turned her face towards the guest. However, instead of reacting to the guard's call, maybe it would be better to say that she reacted to the smell of Anja's makeup. Having been shut up in this room for so long, Ava was sensitive to small changes in smell. So you came, Anje. Ushirimiya Anje, Rudolph and Kyrie's daughter, Battler's younger half-sister. She didn't get to see Battler often, but they got on extremely well and she greatly respected him. Since she was absent due to illness during the family conference, she always survives in solitude. Unfortunately, she has become emotionally disturbed always carries a huge amount of cash with her, and has the bad habit of throwing it around to make sure she never has to wait. What does uh, Ava say right now? Kinzo's second child, hostile towards her brother Kraus and opposes him in almost everything, from issues dealing with the family fortune to... Oh, okay, this is the same thing as before. Okay. Yes, I did. You did call me. On Ava's face, you couldn't find the expression of one warmly welcoming their niece. And on Anjay's face, you couldn't see the expression of one pleased to see their aunt. Ava waved her arm, which had grown as thin as a withered branch, and motioned for the guard to leave. The guard bowed silently and went out into the hall. It's not only stuffy, but dark, too. Why don't you have the curtains opened? And then, the hitman you hired will shoot through the window, is that what you're planning? If it came to that, I'd much rather be the one paid to do the hit. All I'd have to do is relax at home for a month and the job would take care of itself. <laughs> Their discussion was quite morbid for an aunt and niece. However, they didn't look like they were joking. At the very least, Ava did believe that someone was after her life. All of the Ushirimiya family's massive fortune had come into the possession of Ushirimiya Ava. It was said that this fortune also included the ten tons of hidden gold that Ushirimiya Kinzo was rumored to have kept concealed. They could do nothing while this vast wealth was in the hands of the cunning, sly, and extremely suspicious Ava. But it was rumored that if it was passed on to Anje, who was no more than a young girl, certain people were plotting to snatch it away at once. By now, Ava and Anje were Kinzo's only descendants. 
If Ava died, all of the wealth would go to Anja. And if Anja were to be killed as well, that wealth would go to the family of Anja's mother, Kyrie. In this sense, not only Ava, but Anja as well, was in a position where it wouldn't be odd at all for her life to be targeted by some unknown person. And Ava had hated Anja for a long time, because after losing her precious only son, George, she had learned that the only one who had survived to inherit her own wealth was Anja, who had been absent from that family conference 12 years ago. Ava shunned Anja, hated her, even detested her. She isolated Anja in a special school and separated her from the youth and happiness normal people have, trying to deprive her life of all opportunity. However, Ava had succumbed to an incurable illness, and ironically, her remaining life was estimated to be the same as Kinzo's had been at that family conference 12 years earlier. Both Anja and Ava hated each other. Even though they were each other's last blood relatives, they hated each other so much that they hoped the other would die quickly. And why did you go to all the trouble of calling me? I don't have much time left. These quack doctors still have no idea what I was poisoned with. But I know. I'm sure that it's that secret assassination drug, and the one the foreign intelligence agency was using. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be killed. Aren't you lucky? Very soon I will die, and then you'll be so relieved. What a pitiable person. This always happened. She immediately deviated from the main topic, distorting into a more unsettling discussion. Ava, who was full of suspicion, believed that someone was always after her life. Indeed, after inheriting the vast wealth of the Ushirimiya family, she had used wild methods just like Kinzo had done in the past, and had repeatedly made money by any means necessary, creating many enemies along the way. With a massive supply of capital, she had launched aggressive takeovers against businesses which were starting to have rapid growth, making them buy it back at a high price under the guise of reconciliation. Ironically, it was the same type of action that her husband's company had been hit with 12 years ago. She had repeated this constantly for the past 12 years. She had also earned a lot of hatred. If her husband had heard of this from beyond the grave, he might have defended her, saying that this was because of the loneliness from losing her family. However, no one who knew her now could come to her defense. For some time, Ava waxed eloquently about how exactly her life was being targeted, listing off names of people who likely held hatred for her and sneering at the fact that she hadn't been killed. Even when Anje heard her own name included in that list, her expression did not change significantly, and she waited indifferently for Ava to tire herself out. You know what? I really hate you. I'm honored. Same here. I built this future for George's sake. To think that it would be snatched away by you. To think that it would be stolen by Rudolph's daughter. <laughs> I can't bear it. To think that not only will I not leave a child, but even my fortune will be stolen. That, to me, is just... unforgivable. In that case, why don't you give all of your fortune to charity? What happened to all those religious people you've requested so many times? <laughs> they all say the same thing. My excessive wealth has become a burden to me. They always say something about how I need to give it up and cleanse myself. <laughs> and then the idea came to me to stop donating for a time Ava had invited in the founders of several strange new religious cults perhaps looking for peace in her heart but in the end they did not give her heart any relief and only further increased her suspicion if you've got money to burn why don't you just start buying up thoroughbreds and make some, make some corned beef I've thought of something even more interesting I've racked my brains over it a lot. What could I do to make things horrible for you? Uh, Tofu64, uh, I actually have to step in on this claim because many, many streams ago, somebody asked me which Umineko character I related to the most. And I told you I couldn't tell you because that character had not shown up yet. Well, she's here now. Uh, yeah. Uh, it says an uncomfortable amount about me that I relate to Anje the most. <laughs> so. <clears throat> I've racked my brains over it a lot. What could I do to make things horrible for you? I thought about just killing you. 
I also thought about erasing all of my wealth, leaving you penniless and kicking you out of the Ashirimiya family or something. Wouldn't that be wonderful? A lady brought up prim and proper, made to crawl around and prowl for some moldy bread and muddy water. Oh, that would be truly glorious. <laughs> <laughs> Having fun? Oh yes, it's fun to scare you. But very soon I will die. So I thought about how I can continue to cause you pain even after I die. And then... <laughs> It was surprisingly simple. I called you because I wanted to tell you about it. Whoops. I not mean to drop that. I have midterms coming up. Keep it brief. I've decided. I will have you inherit all my fortune. Huh? Not only that. I've decided until the very day that I die, I'll increase that fortune as much as I can, inflate it to massive proportions, and have you inherit all of it. <laughs> can you even imagine what that would be like? No idea, because I'm stupid. <laughs> no, you wouldn't have any idea, would you? Look forward to it, it really is fun being rich. Every day from morning till night, monsters from across Japan will come to play. From now on, your entire private life will be followed by talk shows and weekly magazines. The media criticize me no matter what I do or don't do. If I donate, they'll attack me as a bourgeoisie, but if I begrudge them that money, I'll be abused as a miser. Oh, every day really is wonderful, you see. I realize that I would love to invite you to that kind of life when you're so young and have so much ahead of you. Isn't that just to die for? The public is right in front, is right in its criticism of all that you've done. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm sure they are. Go ahead, insult me as much as you want. And then you'll be burdened with that criticism. Japanese culture says that good people live in honorable poverty while the wealthy should die. No matter what you do or do not do, you will eventually be held up as a symbol of envy and hate from across Japan. <laughs> I wonder how twisted your life will become after living this way. You will have no allies. No one will listen to your worries. Insulting you will become a public sport, and no one can stop that. Oh, Archer. <laughs> oh, I'm really looking forward to it. I wonder how you will live your life and how you'll end it. Relish your life of being unable to trust anyone in the world, love anyone, or talk with anyone. I'll be patiently waiting for you in hell, waiting for you to come falling down, bringing that story of hardship with you. <laughs> her insane laughter turned into a painful cough, without changing her expression in the slightest, looking completely unconcerned. Anje stared at the only survivor of Rokenjima. Perhaps because he found the violent coughing odd, the guard flew in as he gave a short knock on the door. Anje glanced at him, wordlessly showing that she hadn't moved a step from where she had been. Anje was prepared for some kind of trap to frame her in Ava's death. However, that was fortunately a needless anxiety. As the guard rubbed Ava's back, he poured hot water from a thermos into a mug. As he did, Ava kept coughing, looking like she was in pain. Anje thought that it was probably the final form of the Witch of Rokenjima, and the last she wouldn't be able to see. Eventually, Ava was able to moisten her throat and regain her normal breathing. However, the glittering madness inside her eyes hadn't subsided in the slightest. <laughs> that cursed mass of gold and the inheritance of you, Shiramiya headship, as well as the name of the Golden Witch Beatrice are now yours. Enjoy your insane, twisted life fitting for the name of a witch. I don't care about those. Enough of that, just tell me this. What happened on Rokenjima that day? I don't believe that there was an accident. Tell me the truth about what happened on that day and why mom and dad and Nissan died. <laughs> oh, that must be the best way to harass you, mustn't it? <laughs> What happened on that day? 
what happened on this very day in 1986. You want to know what they said before they died, don't you? I won't tell you! <laughs> I'll leave behind the cursed cult. But you know what? I'll take the truth you desired with me to hell. That's the best way I can harass you. Upset. If you want to hear, try going to hell and asking your family there. In that case, you better die right now, right? <laughs> Why don't you just give up and die now and forever? <laughs> That laugh continued until she started coughing again. And that cough did not subside until she started moaning and going into convulsions. <laughs> Thank you, Carpal Sack. October 4th, 1986. On Rokenjima, the Ushirimiya family's customary and final family conference was held. And on the next day, October 5th, an extremely unfortunate accident occurred, and the Ushirimiya family was wiped out. As good luck would have it, Ushirimiya Eva escaped from that, and succeeded almost all of the fam Ushirimiya family's fortune. However, due to the many turbulent rumors surrounding the Ushirimiya family, the way Eva acted afterwards, and her unnatural actions at the time of the unfortunate accident, there was public controversy over whether this might have been a plot to get all of the inheritance for herself. Under pressure from the public, prosecutors attempted numerous investigations, and the media began tracing the outline of the murder plot under the name of Rokenjima Gate. But in the end, they were not able to find sufficient proof that this unfortunate accident was a crime. However, because the media continued to give the impression that Rokenjima Gate was a murder plot by Ava, public opinion began to believe that she was the true culprit. Of course, all that easily condemnable overbearing financial activity which she had carried out using that vast wealth left a bad impression that only made matters worse. Every time she did something and the rumors started spreading, the talk shows would bring back Rokenjima Gate, blaming the justice system by saying that she, saying she was the true culprit, and that the only reason she hadn't been arrested was even because, because even the police had been bribed. And the impression that she was in an evil criminal grew stronger and stronger. Her heart eventually degenerated, and ironically, it began to transfigure her into the kind of human that the public expected. By now, Eva had no one that she trusted, and no family. Her beloved husband Hideyoshi was already no more, and the talk shows would occasionally mention his company, saying that it was run recklessly while criticizing and disgracing its former accomplishments. Even her beloved son, George, George was dramatized as the stereotypical rich, lazy son that the public expected and no one even attempted to figure out what a simple and honest character he had possessed. As to, much how all of this hurt, as to how much all of this hurt Ava and ran her to ruin, no one was interested. The public was only interested in the idea of an evil woman who had gone so far as to kill her whole family to become a multimillionaire, and in what kind of pitiful final years she would lead. So she changed more and more, until eventually, Ava's personality was transfigured to the point that she was treated as a lunatic. It was said that she sometimes remembered that this, exact, this was exactly the same way her father, Kinzo, who she had once admired, had been in his later years, and laughed at herself with scorn. And on the day of that finally, final family conference, because Ushirimiya Rudolph's daughter, Anje, had been sick and had stayed with her mother's family, she had not participated. At the age of six, she lost her family and gained Ava as her guardian. Since Anje had become Ava's only blood relative, Ava took very good care of her. She had imposing guards always surrounding Anje's person to prevent her from coming to harm. Anje had even her right to play with her friends, to come home from school together and to enjoy the seasons together, stolen, so that she can live a full and pleasant school life. Ava sent Anje to an elegant boarding school which took care of her every need, completely isolating her from the world. She didn't even know the popular songs that girls her age might hum. She was never once given a chance to enjoy window shopping with her friends or stuff her mouths with crates, much less an encounter with a member of the opposite sex to make her heart throb. Anja did not have a single friend. 
If anyone carelessly acted friendly with Anje, they would be scolded by the guards or else the teachers. All of them were strictly ordered not to let the peasants approach the daughter of the esteemed Ushiramiya family. During that time, the talk shows were always talking about Ushiramiya Eva, and always spreading rumors about her many financial evil deeds. Those who found out that she was the, her daughter naturally began to keep their distance. Even now, she was called a witch at school, and any time something adverse happened, it was base, baselessly whispered as truth that the school was operating according to her wishes, and that she had something to do with it. The environment makes the person. By now, she had a heart as hardened as those around her feared. She trusted no one and didn't even try. She loved no one and didn't even try. And on top of all of this, when Ava caught an incurable illness, it was whispered that this too had been planned, and this time, Anje was set up as the mastermind. Everyone whispered that the daughter of a witch was a witch. Even the talk shows and the weekly magazines whispered that. So Anje too, because of that, no. As though it might as well be true, accepted it. Therefore, since she already believed that she was a witch, when she heard that the name of the Golden Witch was being turned over to her, she felt nothing as if not completely unfazed. However, she was at least sure of one thing. This title of the witch that she had inherited would definitely never be inherited by anyone else. She would be the last head of the Ushiramiya family, and the last isolated Golden Witch. Anja could be seen on the roof of a skyscraper. Compared to the winds of the world which had beaten down upon her until now, this strong cold wind was warm and pleasant. Below her lay a beautiful nighttime scene and a dazzling river of red and white lights. It was a clear sky tonight, so there really should have been countless stars stretching out over the sky. However, the light from the ground was so bright you couldn't see them at all. Anja couldn't help but think that this is what she, what she really saw lay somewhere in that unseen starlight. The world of reality below her looked so far away from here. This place felt to her as, clo to, as the closest to the world she really should be in. There was only one thing that Anje cursed. Why had I not been able to go to that family conference on that day 12 years ago? If I had gone, I would probably have been able to be with my family forever. Recently, I've been having a dream about my family over and over again. Myself of 12 years ago calls out frantically, urging them not to go to the family conference. But both my mom and dad are too far away. My hand won't reach them. I reach for the hand of Battler Nissan, who always really loved me, for the hand that would always pat my head. But even though it looks like it's so close to reaching, even that falls short. For some reason, I started having that dream over and over again. Whenever I have that dream, I repeat my useless effort inside the dream, trying to stretch out my hand even more forcefully. If only Battler Nissan at least could have lived. Then perhaps at least the two of us could have supported each other through life in this cold and lonely reality. But his hand never reaches me. So even if I climb to the roof of a building as tall as this one, I am distantly separated from all of them. A mysterious girl appears in my dreams and urges me. That girl in my dreams urges me to arrive at the truth of what happened 12 years ago. If I could learn what happened to Dad and everyone else on that day, would they come back? At least one of them. There was no way that anyone who existed could answer those words. I understand. In this world, I have no family, no friends, anyone. So... Let's go. Let's go home. To where my family is. From the beginning, Anje's figure had been on the far side of the fence. The scenery below her eyes was distant, beautiful, and so fantastical that it did not give rise to the slightest bit of fear. If I face down, I'll surely be taken to the world below. So I faced up because I wanted to be taken to the world above, the world where my family was. Who cares about vast wealth? Who cares about cursed gold? Who cares about the golden witch, Beatrice? What I really want isn't something that even a mountain of gold will help me obtain. What I need for that is just a small amount of courage, 
to take a single step forward. Just then, I definitely heard a voice. I knew that voice. The voice that had always called to me in my dreams. Before my eyes, in other words, in midair above that jet black nighttime scenery, there was the figure of that girl I had seen in my dreams. She spoke again with the same voice I had heard inside my dreams. Your assistance is needed. My assistance? Who needs it? Your family needs it. Your family is eternally imprisoned in the two day span that began on this day 12 years ago. If I save them, does that mean my family will come back? When I asked the question I most wanted to ask, the girl cruelly stopped talking and hung her head. I cannot promise that. The enemy is the Golden Witch Beatrice, a mighty opponent. I cannot compete with her, but another Golden Witch might be able to manage something. I don't know what you're talking about. The only one who can oppose the Beatrice of 1986 is the final Beatrice of 1998. In other words, you, Andre. Andre Beatrice. That witch from 12 years ago took away my family? Yes. She is responsible for what happened to your family. The source that always leads to your future of isolation. My family's killer. In exchange, I will search for the fragment with the ideal world that you wish for. The world where your family comes home. But I can't promise to you that your, your desire will be granted. The game board of 1986, Beatrice, is quite perfect. I planned on bringing you that ideal fragment as a present today, but I still can't find it. It's a very firm fate. I haven't seen the likes of it since I fought with Lambda Delta. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm giving you a chance for revenge. In exchange, I promise to find and bring you the happiest resolution that's possible for you to receive. It may be a fruitless effort. Even if you succeed in your revenge, there's no definite proof that your family will all return. Even if with a miraculous pop probability, you may only be able to bring one person back. Andre now understood the meaning of that dream. That dream where it seemed that with just a little bit more, her hand might at least be able to reach Battler Nisa. A miraculous probability is still higher than zero, right? Is it about 1%? All probability values are powerless before the result, so I cannot tell you that number. But unlike if I don't do anything, there definitely is a small possibility. Yes. As long as you do not throw your hope away, but prepare yourself, it's extremely close to zero. All right. I'm in. Are you sure? You'll probably never be able to come back here again. This is not the world where I belong. And as for the world where I do belong, I'll find it myself. Tell me your name. The Witch of Miracles, Bernkisto. And by that name, I acknowledge you as the Golden Witch, Andre Beatrice. Andre Beatrice, the final witch born in 1998, named by Ava as her, her successor and accepted with Bernkisto as her guardian. She is starting from zero as a witch. But, as her body is located 12 years in the future, she possesses ultimate magic resistance that prevents her from being targeted by any of Beatrice's magic. Additionally, completely con converse to her older brother's magic resistance, she has a natural talent for attacks against magic types. Her potential in both attack and defense is of the highest level, but the distance is great. 12 years really is. As of now, you were a true witch. The instant she proclaimed that I was a witch, I felt dizzy, as though something inside me had changed drastically. Just then I heard a slam. It was the sound of the door connecting the staircase to the roof being opened. There were Aunt Ava's guards. Guards only a name. Aren't they a cage that's closest to me, shutting me in? They saw I was already on the other side of the fence and dashed forward, horrified. It's going by itself. 20, target found. Requesting assistance on the roof. Andre san we were looking for you. It's dangerous there, so quickly, come this way! What's that? 
My fan club. I'm pretty popular. No point in getting caught. Let's go. Ooh, it's banger time! I think there is a, a little stinger at the end as well, if I remember correctly. But we, uh, we got a jam for a second. Hopefully this won't get copyright detected, but if it is, unfortunately it might be muted in the VOD. Sorry if that happens. Uh, Daisuke Ono, isn't he a big deal? Yes, uh, Daisuke Ono voices Battler, and Daisuke Ono voices uh, Jotaro Kujo from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Uh, he also voices Silver the Hedgehog, fun fact. Looking annoyed, Burn Castell turned on, turned on her heels. In the jet black sky, watching that perfectly casual gesture, I followed her as though it was completely normal. Anjasan! Wait! Don't be hasty! Look out! Oh, it's no good. It's no goddamn good at all. Time to go. See you again. Please, send a limo to get me. Because everyone else will be with me too. See you. And that, everyone, was episode three of Umi Neko. What'd you fucking think? <laughs> Let's uh, go ahead and look at our, our last couple of like tips and stuff, and then we'll get started with Theory Corner. Okay, so we've we've got a we've got a couple of new things here. Um, Chester Sisters Imperial Guard Corps, an Imperial Guard Corps formed by the Dragon King Pin Dragon in celebration of the Red Dragon's flight and composed only of sisters. They were originally subordinates of the Dragon King, but because of a long relationship with past Beatrice, he permitted two of the Imperial Guard soldiers to be lent out. The sisters are beings with false life, created by magic. For that reason, sisters with a great variety of personalities are even now being created as their numbers continue to increase. Manifesting into the human world requires a great cost, and summoning them is difficult even without taking their tremendous fighting power into consideration. For this reason, they are often summoned as honor guards in special ceremonies. Uh, Care Baron Ross with the two dollars. I can't believe Anjay is dream drop distancing. Oh my god. Uh, I, I hate that you said that, but also you're not wrong. Uh, the Chester's Golden Bow. One of the pieces of sniping equipment belonging to the Chester Sisters Imperial Guard Corps. The arrow's trajectory can be controlled at will, but it makes a special talent and special training to master its true potential. Therefore, the equipment itself is a sign of a high-class sniper's prestige. It is a masterpiece anti-armor sniping bow, capable of penetrating a wide variety of armors and barriers, and with a rich variety of selectable ammunition for the arrow's warhead. Furthermore, the ones primarily used throughout the story were wire-guided winged piercing rounds. Because they are wire-guided, they are capable of highly deceptive long-distance precision sniping in complicated indoor terrain battles. Junepop45 with the $5, and Anjay having a scene that mirrors Miles Morales' leap is everything. Oh my god, yeah. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you, uh, you bring up a good point. 
Somebody's got to redraw that now. <laughs> um, and regarding the succession of the witch. In the noble families of witches, family secrets are often inherited by a single child to prevent the unchecked propagation of hidden arts and the decline of quality. It is the same with the endless witch, where the greatest hidden art goes to a single child and the predecessor retires after passing it on, protecting even more strongly against the spread of the hidden art. Custom dictates that a witch from another sect must make a recommendation for the succession. Ava's reference was Lambda Delta. Anjay's reference was Vernkastel. It is unknown who recommended Beato. Furthermore, during the story, Beatrice passed on her name as well, but this custom only began recently. The predecessor was the original Beatrice, and all endless witches before her had different names. After that, it became customary that the name was also inherited, and Ava, following that tradition, gave Anjay the name of Beatrice. Let's look at the grimoire stuff because I didn't I didn't bring it these up at the time, but like obviously I think you should like these aren't like terribly difficult to know, but I'll read them out just in case anybody didn't catch them. So katakana is one of the phonetic scripts used. Like this was when uh, Battler was like, hey, don't write your name in katakana, Beato. Did write it more cur like cursive or whatever. Uh, katakana is one of the phonetic scripts used in Japanese writing, one of, its, one of its uses being to write foreign words. When foreign words are written in katakana, they are forced into the Japanese sound system. So beatorice in katakana is actually pronounced beatorice. This Japanese pronunciation of beatrice is the reason for her nickname of beato. In this scene, Battler is suggesting that she should write her, the name in its original beautiful form instead of the Jap Japanese version. However, as we s have just seen with Maria, a katakana name, which we have represented with small caps, may be a deliberate choice for certain characters, witches in particular. In the original Japanese, many characters, including ordinary real-world characters like Kumasawa, Chiyo, as well as Ronove, the Chiesters, and all of the stakes use katakana names. To ease readings, we have chosen to restrict the usage of small caps to the full names of witches, where katakana seems to have a special significance. And... Galge. Short for gal games, girl games, the term generally describes non-adult visual novels that feature attractive girls as a main hook, including but not limited to dating sims. The definition of the term is fuzzy, and it may also be used in a wider sense it includes adult games. <laughs> Beatrice literally said that she was playing uh, dating sims with hot women. <laughs> that's, that's really funny. <laughs> okay, so... Let's go to the characters menu. I am curious about some things. First of all, uh, no execute command for Anjay. You can't do it. But I do want to see if Ava has one. No, Ava does not have one either. Okay. But everybody else does, I suppose. Yes, it does. Uh, yeah, I guess nobody else really has anything that we have to check at the moment. Oh, can you- oh, you can change her into her school uniform, that's cool. Uh, what does it say for Jessica? Did we not check Jessica earlier? Oh, okay. Missing. She was indeed joined with Canon in the Golden Land. They apologized to each other for their cowardice and told each other their true and honest feelings, and they hugged each other until the final moment. Afterwards, she was chewed to bits by demons and went to hell. It's okay. Canon is with her. And let's check Battlers. Yeah, we, we already saw that one. It's okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Anything, anything else? Anything else important? What does Battler's Execute say? We already saw that. It was the one that talked about him being killed by Ava. Uh, we did check Nanjo, right? Yeah, yeah, we saw that one too. What do you mean? No, we didn't. I brought it up exactly when it happened. <laughs> you guys are trying to gaslight me. Ava, uh, Ava. <laughs> Chad is trying to gaslight me. 
Um, Medlomar sales with the five dollars. There's two bonus tips I want to check when you consider them to not be spoilers anymore. The Tanabata one, and especially anti mystery versus anti fantasy. Yes, I will be. <sighs> I will be going over some of the additional content once we get past episode four. Um, be, like, I'm basically, like, what I'm planning to do is once we get past episode four, I am going to dedicate a stream to just reading some of the extra content that came out between all of these four episodes, and then after that, we will move on to the, the answer arcs, or the core arcs, I guess, uh, after that. All of the chat is Ava. Yeah, you're you're all Ava, and you're all tormenting me specifically. Oh, um, but anyway, Curie Map Pat time. Um, let's uh let's talk. What what do you think's going on? Give your theories. Let's do it. And while you're doing that, I am going to check my phone real quick. Okay, looked at my phone for a second. Let's look at what you guys are saying. Um, may have an idea about Nanjo's death. Shannon and Canon, I am curious if they changed because of Beato bringing them back. Also, does Beato have a new execute because of Ava Truche attacking her? No, she does not. Uh, we are the Ava tier on Uh, they came out in between. Interesting, the console version doesn't do that. Um. The the console version does have them. It just like I don't think it specifically tells you when they came out. Um Lambda Delta and Burn Castell are in Homestuck hate romance with each other and Andre is a prince of time. You know what? Fair fair, fair enough. Uh I would say that Lambda and Burn are definitely like vacillating red and black romance though, like constantly. Um what the hell happened to Nanjo? I need to know. <laughs> I don't know. You'll have to think about it. Normal Gabriel with the $5. I have an observation theory that is honestly just far too long, so this is here so I don't feel guilty. No, don't, don't worry about it. That's what this section of the stream is for. Uh, and yes, I will, I will get to the, uh, the fan art. Thank you for reminding me. Um... It is true that those mentioned in red died, but we do not know if those we see on the island are who they claim to be. Okay. I don't think there was a single culprit nor a single murder plan per se. Like, I don't think Ava planned on Hideyoshi and George dying. That is a, a fair point to bring up. Do you think that uh, Ava, even if she committed all of the other murders, would have uh, killed George and Hideyoshi? Well, obviously we know that uh, Hideyoshi probably wasn't killed by her, um, based on the circumstances. But, uh... Uh, my theory for Kinzo being dead at the beginning of each game still works in the favor of beating Ava Beatrice's Red Web. She never specifies the 18 people were the 18 listed, or there were only three people were alive when Nanjo was murdered. 18th person who looks like Beatrice still works as a culprit for Nanjo, who then presumably died somehow. Interesting. Okay. Um, oh my god, it scrolled me down by itself. I hate when it does that. Um... Since of David being dead long before the start is really starting to make sense to me. That leaves me wondering what happened in the first Twilight. I've been wondering whether Ava Trice was even real or if it was just part of Beato's grand deception. Um, in a manner of speaking, uh, I mean, obviously I can't confirm or deny magic, but like in terms of like being an individualized character, then yes, Ava Beato is an individual character. Uh, she wasn't just part of the ruse. 
I can confirm that one. I don't feel like pulling up the red truth thing right now, but just take my word for it. Uh, are we sure that Anjay isn't actually Mukran? Stop. No, no, no. <laughs> um, this mystery was spelled out very, fairly clearly. Ava and Hideyoshi were the killers. Hideyoshi was killed by Kyrie, though it is unknown how exactly George died or Nanjo. Uh, yeah, a very fair assessment. I did tell you guys that this one was uh, intentionally easier. Uh, I think we're definitely trying to... Got a big hint with Beatrice trying to, trying to write her name in Katakana in regards to her true identity. I think someone has a Japanese name unlike any of the family members. Oh, interesting thought. I, I actually didn't consider it like that before, but that is that is an interesting thought, actually. Uh, really seems this is more of an afterlife selling your soul to the devil type situation, seeing how this timeline seemed to continue unimpeded rather than reset like the first time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, I, I agree with Menlo Marsales here, who says, I can't imagine anyone other than Battler himself managing to be successfully impersonated by someone, though. Like, Battler hasn't been there for six years, but everyone knows each other pretty well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Carrie and Ross, I really liked episode three on second viewing. It's incredibly clean and logical why it plays out exactly as it does once you have the exact context of the authorial intent and meaning. Absolutely. It is, like... This episode, more than almost any other, if you know what's going on, it is like the smoothest ride to interpret. Like, everything clicks into place so easily. It's kind of crazy. Like, some of the other ones, you still have to do a little bit of thinking, but this one is like, it's it's right there. Like, the, the, he's basically just waving it in your face. It's, it's great. <laughs> um... I posit that the killer of Nanjo was George or someone, otherwise someone who died after they killed Nanjo. It could be a mutual homicide where Nanjo killed them as well. Hmm. Interesting. Still stuck on what Beato said when she was, <laughs> that she was a test tube baby having the flashback for us. Kinzo planned his death to create a knives out situation because he hates his kids. Well, I wouldn't put it past grandfather. Okay, let's, let's look at normal Gabro's like big one here. Okay. So. The Ushirimiya blood relatives and the furniture servants mostly have the one-winged eagle on their clothes. The sisters of purgatory have it on their skirts, and the Chiesters have thigh tattoos. Beata wears it on her dress, but Ava Beatrice is interesting. Hers is a staff. It's just a thing that she holds and that can be dropped, taken away. Clothes can be taken too, but they're more central. The eagle is inherent to the others who bear it, but for Ava Beatrice it is a literal accessory, and for a projection of Ava no less. Shirimiya Ava, you know, the one, the only one to wear six eagles, twice as many as Kinzo, or I don't know, the one who has it tattooed on her fucking arm. Uh, it scrolled me down again, damn it, okay. Um, yet her others, uh, other of herself has no respect for it. Changing focus, I'd like to look at someone else, the only other human to have the eagle tattooed on their body, that being Shannon. And isn't that strange? Ava's tattoo is a symbol of her refusal to give up the Ushirimiya name despite being a woman, but Shannon isn't even an Ushirimiya. The orphans, like her, normally only work there for a few years and then move on, but she's been there much longer and gotten the eagle tattooed, no less, and on her thigh, too. The only ones with that tattoo in the location, as are mentioned, the Chiester sisters. I can only assume that Shannon is of a similar nature to them. Kumasawa is already Virgilia, and Ronove is already a parallel to Genji Ronove, with only one letter different, U versus V. But they were previously this, and they were previously the same letter. So what if Shannon is a Chiester? Okay. The Chiester guard info says that the sisters are difficult to summon, but we already know that Kinzo has a talent for summoning, so that checks out, in my opinion. That's that's a very. I I'm really liking your uh, your logical like through line here. I'm I'm really liking the way that you're uh, like assembling your pieces here. Uh, once again, I, I have to applaud theories like this in particular, and obviously not saying one way or the other whether it's uh, truthful or not, but like I, but I, I think like theories like this, where you really dig into the minutiae and pull things together like this and really think about it, those are the ones that I am like always the most excited to see during these streams. Uh, that, was, that was really cool, Normal Gabro. Good job. Um... Perhaps someone killed Goda and is now claiming to be him using the OG Goda's corpse in the locked rooms and hid the island and killed Nanjo and maybe George. Uh, Goda Trite reigns supreme. Um, historian Sayori, unless I missed something, it seems to me that maybe George killed Nanjo under Ava's pressure and then cracked and took his own life. Answers with, with what the hell happened to George with Nanjo's homicide. That's interesting. 
Do you do you think that Ava would pressure uh, George to kill Nanjo? Though, I wonder. Uh, Kiryu probably kills Hideyoshi. Unsure about George. Mm-hmm. 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 Um. Uh, Kerber and Ross, I think I'll provide the full red truth list for the question marks with minor contextual information when you resolve episode four, probably. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Definitely, uh, if you want to do that, then feel free. Um, in some ways, it looks like the main problem for the meta meta angle is Lambda Delta. I wonder how her character will progress. Yeah, Lambda's uh, very interesting. Um, we, we learned quite a bit about her and uh, her relationship with Beato in this uh, episode as well, didn't we? Interesting, interesting. Um, so bad at judging characters. I am incredibly trusting. <laughs> no, don't, don't, don't feel bad. I fell for it hook, line, and sinker too. <laughs> I, I just wanted, I just wanted it to be true. Um, I think George committed suicide because of Shannon's death. It's also possible that he figured out his parents were involved and that broke him even more. Um, that's, that's a possibility. Um, however, I would like to briefly push back on this one because earlier, I think it was in this, I think it was in this episode, uh, there's that part where they're talking of, in the cousin's room and George has that sort of part of his internal monologue where he says that if he were to follow Shannon into death, then he like can't, he can only imagine that that would upset her greatly. And so he wouldn't do something like that. And if she were to do the same kind of thing, that he would be equally upset. Um, so, yeah. Uh, that's uh, my, my counterpoint for you. Uh, I have to be honest until you said... Oh, God, it scrolled me down again. Why did it s slide me down so far? Okay. Until you said in the last stream, the scenes didn't really literally happen, still held emotional truth. It hadn't occurred to me that not every scene literally happened. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also, I was checking for the red truths for this episode and I found something interesting. There's apparently a manga exclusive red truth. Is that real or? Um, yes, the manga exclusive red truth is real. Ryukishi did uh, back that up, but because we're only reading the VN, Please do not drop the manga exclusive red truth in the chat. Uh, if anybody wants to put it in like the Discord in a spoiler tag or something and mourn for it, you can. But like, yeah, just just be careful about that. Uh, really shocked by Virgilia's heel face turn though. Pretty much everyone was. That's super surprising, and I'm curious to see what she has in terms of more character depth. Yeah, no, the, the Virgilia's face was terrifying. <laughs> it got me. Hmm. <laughs> I wonder if the fact that Beatrice doesn't use the Chiester sisters is at all important. Like, she does she use the stakes purely for aesthetic reasons, or is there a notable downside to the Chiesters? Well, they did say that the Chiesters were very hard to summon, and that she basically, like, didn't have the power up until now to be able to do that. Uh, because she has been growing in influence steadily, so obviously, you know, like, uh, some other furniture that she hasn't been able to summon until now, like Ronave. <clears throat> A face heel turn, not the other way around. Yeah. Um, only confirmed that they were dead in general and that they could have killed Nanjo before dying. I don't know if someone needs to have been alive to axe Nanjo. Um, This episode's being easier, can't relate. Episode one and two, I was like, okay, yeah, it's magic, great. In the end, we got to the real world and to see Ava shoot Battler, so now I confuse. <laughs> uh, I think there was a theory last time that Kinza was already dead. Uh, okay. For normal Gabriel, I remember human Beatrice from episode two also had it tattooed on her thigh. Did she? I can't remember, hold on. I actually do want to look back at this real quick. Bear with me for a second. Um, okay. So, she sure fucking does. Yeah, look here. Episode two, Human Beato on the game board does in fact have the thigh tattoo. You were right about that. Good catch. Good catch.
Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. Scrolled me down again. Once again. Uh. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Looks like Beatrice isn't even interested in winning. It's possible that Beato is being pressured to play a role right now. Uh, I don't know. Uh, one observation, I think, for Julia is the one that came up with the Gaslighting Battler plan and her little chat with Beato earlier when she gave a tip was her letting Beato enter into her plan. Okay, yeah, I, c I can actually confirm that one. Remember when uh, Virgilia pulls Beato aside and she's like, listen, you know, like... North wind and the sun. You remember that? You remember that, Beato? You remember that strategy? And Beatrice is like, oh yeah, sure, Master. I remember North wind and the sun, of course. We, we need to have a conversation about that. That was Virgilia pulling Beato aside and being like, listen, you, got, you gotta butter him up. You, you gotta pull the wool over his eyes, dude. You gotta be like s sweet and like s submissive. And you, you gotta be like the perfect woman that he wants to swoop in for. <laughs> You got you gotta put on those tears. You got you gotta put on that makeup, girl. You gotta make him want it. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's it's a funny thing to catch when you know that it happens. Um. As a staunch anti-magic believer, it's sad to say I theorize Anja committed suicide by jumping off the roof in her arrival in the Golden Lands, meeting the cast in Meta Heaven. Um, mm, yeah, I, I, mm, yeah, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that. Ah, ba, 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 ba. So happy to be experiencing Umineko like this with everyone. I'd be so lost and confused going through with it on my own. Yeah, it is It is pretty difficult, but uh, having a, a community around this has actually been like really fun for me. Even though I know Umineko like the back of my hand, getting to see you guys like get hyped for all the moments and then like uh, think about it together is, is very fulfilling for me. It's, it's definitely one of the better decisions that I've made in recent time. Like I... Uh, I actually really do look forward to this. Not to get not to get mushy for a second, guys, but like I, I really enjoy doing Umineko streams with you guys. It, it's uh, it's a very like fun part of my week every time that I do it. Um, especially because like uh, the the past year and some change has been like it's been fucking like crazy for me. And there's a lot of shit going on that I don't want to get too into detail about. But like you know, it's um, yeah, it's nice. Thanks for thanks for coming along and thanks for tuning in and letting me do this. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, okay, let's see. What was uh, what was Easy Fizz saying? Uh, another thing I thought of was that during the NJT party was how it talked about that through her isolation was how her version of Beatrice came about. Uh, okay, interesting. Did you put in your second message? You said one of two. I don't see the second one though. Oh, okay, there it is. Which is very reminiscent about Ava Trece ended up happening, which makes me wonder how small Ava ended up inside Ava in the first place. This is rhetorical, I just found it interesting. Yeah. There are, there are a lot of interesting parallels between characters in this series. Gang, I really can't think I used all of my brainchild on the cigarettes theory. ERA, that is like fine. You, you like nailed one of the actual murders like before it ended up getting explained. That is nothing to sneeze at. Like that's actually really good. Now granted, this one was made to be a little easier to solve than some of the others, but like even so, like picking up on small details like that before they are brought back to attention is like that's that's very impressive. Like you you did you pulled that one out really well. Uh, I think it's interesting that Beatrice on the human side can be executed, but Ava and Anja can't. It gives the impression that even with the taunting text that accompanies her execute screen. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess I should probably. 
um, say something. Well, well, actually, let me interrupt myself for a second. Near Fantasy, let's uh, let's not talk about Higurashi stuff here too much. Uh, I don't want to mention it too much for people who are are not super familiar with Higurashi or want to go through it with them uh, through it themselves. Uh, anyway, um, but I, I I think that I should actually um, bring it back to this for a moment. Uh, hold on, I'll actually find the red truth sound effect this time. I won't be lazy. Don't play it yet. Don't play. Don't play it yet. I told you not to play it yet. Okay. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> uh, one thing that I want to get on the record, uh, for everyone, so that we can just have this out of the way and you don't have to worry about it. The future depicted at the end of this episode is the real future. Ava survived. And now Anjay is the only one left. There you go. I, I just I just wanted to get that out so that nobody went like, you know, oh, but maybe we could be seeing like an alternate future. Maybe, you know, that's not what really happened or whatever. Like, like I am, I'm putting it like cards on the table up front. That is the real future. That is the single future. Real in what sense? What does real mean? I mean as in like you, know, you could like all of the all of the scenarios of the game board that we've seen up until this point Like you could say like oh those are like versions of the the situation or like interpretations of the situation or whatever But even if we don't know specifically what happened on the island yet Everything that happens after that off of the island we know that that is true. We know that Ava came back and nobody else did. And we know that Anje is now left. So, the, like, the, the world of 1998, that is, that's consistent. Like, that is something that we know that no matter what happens on the game board, no matter what version of events that we see, it leads to that outcome somehow. Now, um, granted, uh, I, I do want to bring this up because Daniel brought it up just a second ago and said, okay, so that happens in every, every single variation of the game. Not necessarily. Um, and the reason why I need to specify that is because, remember, in episodes one and two, Ava dies. So we can then take from there and come to a conclusion that episodes one and two are not how it happened. Probably. Because those scenarios necessarily involve Ava dying, and Ava's not dead. <laughs> or at least, she wasn't dead at the time. She's gonna be dying very shortly. <laughs> um, it'll, it'll make sense more uh, as we continue. But, uh... And to be f like to be clear, I just want to go ahead and say I'm not saying that the events of Episode Three's game board are canon either, though. I'm just saying that the outcome is canon. Um, so don't take that as me saying like Ava's definitely the culprit. It's commonly thought by people in universe in the future, but you don't know for sure whether that's the case now, do you? Anyway, uh, I don't want to confuse you guys too much, so uh, I'm not going to get too, too, too further into it, but, uh, but yeah, I just, I just wanted that to be laid down so that there was no, like, arguing over whether, like, future Anje was real or, like, whether Ava actually lived or anything like that, because, you know, a lot of, a lot of what we're going to be seeing from here on out kind of like that stuff is important 
to consider. So I don't want that premise like being waffled about the whole time. You know what I mean? Um. Anywho. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, get up the fan art tag because somebody said that they posted fan art. There it is. Uh, let me get this image link. And get it in my window. Actually, do I do I have a message about dinner? I sure do. Fuck. Okay, I, I gotta wrap this up uh, very fast. Guys, give me just a second. We will we will be getting to this, but I wanna eat. So I'm I'm gonna have to get through art very quickly. Okay, okay. Let me turn off Curry Map Pat. Let me get this window open. And let me turn on the fan art layer and go to this. Yes. Okay, so first, this one actually wasn't technically put in the stream tag, but I wanted to show it anyway because it's good. It's very good. This was fan art by, um, done by Twitter user Siglies? Siglies? I'm sorry. I don't know how to pronounce it. But uh, I was uh, been watching Nezumi VA's Umineko story times to get me through the day, and I wanted to doodle something about it. Canons. And it's this is very good canons. I love these canons. They're such good canons. Very good. Very scrunkly. Um, after this, we have something from Daniel, as usual again, <laughs> literally just normal people club. Read through with the Nezumi VA crew is still going strong. We're nearing the episode end of episode three now, and I think at some point in the last stream, I realized that in Umineko, all of the members of the Ashiramiya family are part of the nightmare soul-destroying inner family politics, and most of the servants have been so badly abused they don't even see themselves as human and don't realize something has been wrong has been done to them. Kumasawa is in a weird gray area because we don't really know her full deal other than the magical version of events she's a god gosh dang witch. These two, on the other hand, Nanjo is just a doctor. He wants to do his job, and he has a friendship with Kinzo, even though Kinzo also sucks. Go to cook it to meatball. <laughs> They're simple. They're wonderful. They're just normal people. I made this kind of shit posty art to commemorate that. And all this magic fuckery and all this patriarchal bullshit, we have two rocks of normalcy. <laughs> just two guys. And then uh, we also have this follow-up. They're just normal men, Bathurkun. Indeed. They are simply innocent men. <laughs> the fucking normal men meme. Uh, yes, I know they might be the accomplices or culprits in one or more of the murders, but they're still simple on paper. Don't ruin this. I'm excited to see the conclusion of episode three tomorrow. Uh, yeah, and, and that's what just happened. Uh, thank you, Daniel. This is, this is great. Very good. Um, and then we have this, a little doodle page from Astral Thunder. Few just barely finished lining this spread before stream ended, featuring some T4T Jessica slash Canon because of course. Very understandable. Uh, I really like your art style here. Um, the, the little pouty Ava Beato is great. Um, and, and the little scrunkly Maria also great, very good. Um, am I streaming again soon? I will talk about that in just a second. But yeah, this is, uh, this is really good. Uh, thank you, Astral Thunder, for the, the wonderful art. I love this. Oh, wait, the stitched heart. I just realized the stitched heart. Oh, that's really good. That's, that, oh, that's good stuff. Thank, yeah, the, uh. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, okay, okay. Um... So yeah, now we've gotten through all the art stuff, so I will uh, briefly talk about our uh, next plans real quick so that you guys 
know what's up. Okay, so here's the deal. Once again, since we have finished an episode of Umineko, I'm going to be doing what I have done the past two times, and I'm going to be taking a one-week break from Umineko. So no Umineko next week. However, I will still be doing some things next week. I have planned to at least do a Danganronpa Another stream next week. That's what I'm hoping. And I also have a, a s sort of surprise, special, one-time-only kind of deal stream that I will keep a mystery for now that I am also planning to maybe do next week. But we'll see. And then after after next week, uh, after the one-week break, we will return with Umineko episode 4 the week after that. Am I doing something for 413? Probably not. But, uh... Yeah, so we'll we'll see. Uh, I hope you guys look forward to it. But until then, thank you all for joining me, and uh, I hope you look forward to episode four a week after next. It's going to be a fantastic time, but next week will be a fantastic time too. Please tune in next week. And also, of course, I am still working on the Apollo Justice video. We are revising the script and recording it right now. Editing will begin soon. I'll finally put out a new big video essay. It'll happen. It's real. It's so real. Anyway, no, don't play the opening again. <laughs> uh, I'll see you guys later. Bye.